Hello and welcome to another fantastic show of RGDS, your retro gaming discussion show. It's your host, Paul Driscoll, a.k.a. The Drisk, and joining me, the llama lover himself, yes, it's Gordon King. How are you, buddy? I told you that when I was drunk that night, right? That's between you and I. (laughs) I'm more of an alpaca, I think. Uh, I think they're cuter. <laughs> yeah, they don't spit on you as much. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> uh, I'm doing well, mate. Good, good to be on an episode with you. Oh, it is. Yeah, no, it's good. Good to be doing another one. It's uh, we've been knocking them out of the park. It was good that Atari 800 one that you did. It was great fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean. I've, I've been wanting to do that kind of concept for a little while. Mm. And I mentioned to Rick, I oh, must have been about just shy of what, two years ago, to be honest, saying, you mm. know, I would love this continuing concept of just 8-bit underdogs because it's so easy to do a Spectrum or a Commodore. Okay, we've not been doing much Commodores, but we're redeeming ourselves in this episode. Yeah, there's this, this definitely yeah. Yeah, Commodore. But you know, I mean, we'll speak well, about so. the big hitters, even on social media and whatnot else, but... What about all the other eight bits that were out in the day? So yeah, that was it was good fun to do. Really enjoyed doing an Atari one and had a great blast actually playing the games as well. Mm. So no, that's good. And um, so what you're alluding to here is that in today's episode, as you probably surmise from the title, we thought we would celebrate Jeff Minter himself. And now, of course, uh, this is to tie in with the wonderful release of Lamasoft, the Jeff Minter story, which is the second instalment compilation, a sort of digital museum, as it were, by uh, Digital Eclipse. Uh, they call it the Gold Master series. Yeah. And if, if you've not seen, seen it, I mean, you'll be seeing in the video version sort of clips because we definitely uh, both um, both got it, haven't we? So uh, we both yeah, picked yeah. it up. And it, it really is well done. It really, you know, there's like a museum section which goes through shows like the box art and, and tells the story with uh, video clips and, and, and uh, sort of like actual documentary mini clips with Jeff and that telling his story. But you can go straight to the game section and sort of play the highlighted versions of his game or play through the museum itself you know, mm. at, at the relevant points yeah so i mean i mean just before we actually go into what we've been up to retro wise i mean just in your opinion i mean what what do you what do you think of this compilation and what's your first impression well, I, I think overall digital eclipse have started something really good mm. that entices you to go beyond just saying to yourself well you know what all these games that are out there right where it be the brilliant atari 50th anniversary release that it did prior to this yeah is that you might just say to yourself well you know what i've got all the roms they're easy to get and i'm playing them on emulators and or i have them in real hardware or whatever you want to say right Mm. but the way they do this is approach it with real respect and taste and deliver you this kind of docu gaming that they do that gives you an insight to the world of the you know the company or the programmer because this is okay just our second release Mm. and i'd like to see where these guys evolve to in the future because i think this is a way forward (laughs) (laughs) see yeah that would be my dream yeah but no yeah yeah yeah, i agree with what you're saying yeah yeah that it it makes it worth repurchasing these things for the sake that it's I'm, I'm not going to accuse it of being sh- as sugar coated on the outside i think that's giving it discredit there's a lot of you know a lot of thought a lot of heart a lot of research and just to see developer notes to see documentaries to see archival stuff in the timeline as you move along mm. game covers and you see the cassettes and you can rotate them and look at them and and then let's you've read about the game you've heard about get the game now let's play it i think that's a a really good way forward in proper game preservation, mm. to be honest. Which, which is what we've discussed for... Uh, I mean, we've discussed that for years, isn't it? We, we, we wish there were more companies not just doing like a, a ROM dump yep. of some games and actually do mm-hmm. some some love. But this, this takes it to a, a, another level, which is we could only have dreamed of before. Yeah. The, the other thing I love about it is they really have put a lot of care and effort into making the games not just run well, but look, look like they did... Good back yes, in the day absolutely right from the sort of like curve of the crt monitor to uh even the shine on the crt monitor yep and it you know that that sort of blurry 
feel that you would have had it's wonderfully done and Mm -hmm. uh yeah no i've I've been thrilled to bits i mean this is as as i say the uh, the atari one was more encompassing because obviously it's a whole huge company where llama soft is just jeff minter himself but of course what a library that this man has done so really pleased and it it was reasonably priced i thought i'm 24.99 you know, on release, I, I thought that was pretty reasonable, really. Well, mm. putting it into perspective, think what a game cost us back in the day. One of Jeff Minter's games would set you back anything between, say, five ninety five and nine ninety nine on eight bit period, right? Mm. So, in real terms, you know, moving it forward to, to to today's money, what would that actually be? Far more expensive than what they're charging for an entire archival collection. Mm. Albeit, there's certain games missing more than that later but it's something like what 32 games in this yeah and i know you know to a, a lot of people that there's a lot of very old games here you've got the zx81 and the vic 20 mm-hmm. but i mean for us that's uh, it's nice that they it, you know they are covering these lesser known machines or or yeah. you know lesser experienced machines by a lot of people so it's quite brave and wonderful to do so and it, it does tell his story so yeah, so um, but well, before we get into the main show itself, Kingy, mm-hmm. what have you been up to retro-wise? Well, two things. Or gaming not, wise, yeah. Yeah, gaming wise, a continuing series. So not so retro, but it has ties with. <laughs> I mean, I played this series all my days, and that's Zelda. So mm. I finally sat down and decided that I'm going to play Tears of the Kingdom. I've played and completed every other Zelda game that's ever existed. So why not play and complete? I thought you'd so, already completed it. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I mean, I bought it way you back. You played it for about 100 hours, did you, last time? <laughs> that was Breath of the Wild I played for 100 oh, hours. Oh, so it was Breath of the Wild. Yeah, the Tears yeah. of the King. I thought you were well into Tears of the Kingdom. I didn't realise you'd put it down. No, I just uh, put it down. I, I fired it up. I, I, the, I played the introductory level, yeah. um, which is on the Sky Island before you go down to the mainland down below. Yeah, yeah. And real life just got in the way and just busy with doing the podcast and mm. forgetting I, I made the mistake of being busy with all my other retro stuff which i love doing don't get me wrong yeah, yeah, yeah. forgetting to spend time on me mm. so because of that i've got a, a ridiculous backlog of games but i decided no i'm sitting there and playing this and you know what night after night after night after night after night i had to stop playing it for doing this episode <laughs> dedication listeners dedication and I'm loving it. To be honest, I'm loving it. And I know you're not a fan of these newer ones, uh, and you've you've said your reasons before. But I just get so sucked into the, the Zelda universe. Always have and always mm. will. To the point that it's probably my greatest game series, undoubtedly, because yeah. of I get myself lost in it. Where it'd been, you know, Ocarina. Where it'd be Wind Waker. Where it'd be, you know, the Minish Cap on the the, the Game Boy Advance, oh, which is event. incredible. Yeah. Zelda game, very, you know, um, less less mentioned that one, but yeah, been enjoying that. Aside from that, retro wise, I've bought all the parts in for my Easter holidays project, which will be pinball digital pinball version two. Now, ooh, remember, I made the previous ooh. one. Yeah. Right, and there's some shortcomings of it, and it still works, but mainly it was just a small, cheap, you know slimline small computer inside it that mm. works fine but doesn't handle things at that great resolutions and, and so forth so I always wanted to put a full PC in with a good graphics card that can run pinball at 1080 and make things look more high definition you know nice, what I mean whether, nice. whether I'm running pinball arcade Zen pinball or virtual pinball mm. or any other the Zachariah pinball all these things I want to run them all in it and I've got most of them on Steam, and as I say, they want the virtual pinball as well, which you have to configure and alter. Fine, I'll get there with it. But um, I was thinking of things, just modify how, how to improve upon it. And, I mean, it, it does work. I'm not going to put solenoids in and stuff like that. It just starts getting too complex to get the, the force feedback and stuff like that. I'm not, I'm not going to worry about that too much because it just I'll get bogged down and never get it finished if I do every fine mm. detail. But I just want it's still going to be in a you know a, like a 20, 27 inch one, a more tabletop one, rather than a full size one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to 
I have to draw the line somewhere. I would love a big one, and I, I see these ones that are made with, say, nine hundred. We all love a big one, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, but the women we marry just have to tolerate us anyway, don't we? Um, and my wife tolerates a lot from me, trust me. Um, so yeah, I've I've got plans. So I've got all the parts. I've got the computer, an older computer of mine with a ten eighty Ti graphics card going inside. I've 3D printed some stuff I do. I know I need for it. Um, but what I decided on last minute, and I've ordered all the bits last minute, as well, if the monitor, monitor's in a vertical and decent slope position, why don't I have main vertical on it as well? But then you don't want a big joystick sticking up in front of your pinball table. I, I looked online in Arcade World, and there's one with the detachable shaft. You just unscrew. So when you're playing pinball, the joystick doesn't need to be attached mm. at the that device so it's not obscuring your view and when you want to play vertical main games on it because i've got a computer there i may as well fill the hard drive with you know yeah everything yeah, possible it, yeah. and then i'll just chuck everything from flying shark to you know you know all the, the vertical shooters you know mm -hmm. even Atari warriors and whatnot else i'll just i'll just fill it with vertical games um and that and i'll be happy now so that's my project so that um, sounds a fun project space. yeah i'll document it yeah, no, uh, put it on Discord. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to so I'm going to make some videos so I can put it up mm. on the YouTube channel. Anyway, oh, yeah, that'd so. be good. Put it on the YouTube channel as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, yep. we'll uh, obviously, if you've got any bits, we'll, we'll put it into the you know the video version. Because, of course, you know, it's, it's starting to be quite you know, more and more people are watching the uh, the video version, which is nice. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're, we're getting a lot of positive feedback, you know, with people. So, uh, you yeah, know, ex commuters, a lot of them, isn't it? Mm. People that no longer travel to work, so don't to find the same time to listen to a podcast in the conventional way one would use would, would do it um, therefore they need some if they're at home they want some i wouldn't say eye candy because we are not eye candy yeah, Paul. Yeah. well lucky <laughs> with the way we do it we're not in the video <laughs> no we just do no. the video we don't footage. want to scare yeah exactly the, the, the viewers i don't like using the word viewers will never be a pro, <laughs> um, predominant uh, video podcast but it will always be a complimentary yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I mean, know. it just gives that you know people find it useful even if they listen to the audio podcast because they can. There's only so much we can describe a game as through audio. Whether you know it is you know a video and a and a picture paints a thousand words, so yeah, you can does, see the yeah. game. So it, you know they, they both complement each other very yeah. well. Yeah, anyway, for me though, i mm. uh, right. Okay, so I've got a fun announcement to give uh, people. I've been itching to tell people but after we did the um the top 100 sinclair list and you know <laughs> that was uh, that was a great undertaking and i said i would get my revenge yes yeah um so we decided to hit up on and it's still uh, months away i want to warn people of that but we decided to do uh, our own rgds top 50 amiga game list so decided by kingy rick and myself and we we thought we you know like we did originally with the spectrum top 40 list that we did for you know that was that was very popular because i think it's important you say what you like before you even consider saying what other people like yeah you know, like there but what's exciting with it and the reason it's taking you know still probably a few months away is because i decided to do one of my crazy projects and um write a book well there's actually two books now because it was getting so big to really deep dive into all not just the 50 games that we're talking about but any of the attaching games so yeah you know because it, it doesn't make sense to just talk about um well i guess most people would guess something like lotus 2 yeah it doesn't make sense just to talk about that game you've got to talk about lotus one and lotus three yeah. the series yeah. so yeah. it's actually a lot more than 50 and i've gone more with than that i've um i've, I've done a like a, a history of the amiga a deep dive into every hardware model and um you know talking about the develop key developers and publishers and all the bundles all the game bundles that you could buy over the years and yeah. and I mean, it's coming on leaps and bounds. I've um, I've, I've already finished the first book. We just need. Um... It doesn't sleep, by the way. Doesn't sleep. You you see you, you see version just as it's version twenty nine for argument's sake, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's showed you this at midnight, okay? And yeah. then 
halfway through the day, you've got a ping, version 30 is up, and you look at that, there's another 100 pages written. Seriously, this man is an engine. Yeah, when I, when I, when I enjoy something, I, 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 uh, I, know, I, I, know. I do go rattling through. But yeah, no, it's coming on leaps and bounds. I mean, the, the first book's version of the book, which obviously takes you up to 26, mm-hmm. and, and all the history and everything, that's... Um, we we just got to proofread it and get the contributions from. Yeah, because Rick and I are also, yeah. and I'm, I apologise because I've been playing Zelda. I've not. I need to get. Well, as long as it's something important, Kingy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but Rick and I are adding our, our little comments on each yeah. of the games on the yeah. chosen list as well. I mean, we can't take the credit away or the the steam away from the amount of work that Drisky has put into this. That's for sure. But it's nice to see views from all of us on the games that we're mentioning. Yeah, um, last... yeah. So yeah. you've got like a you've got you've got our main review and then you'll have like um the personal take, usually where we where certainly in my case I we, I get to bitch about oh it shouldn't be yeah, it shouldn't be on our list or it should I, be. I done that with one. Did you read it the other day? <laughs> yeah, there? yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna get one to me there. It's like <laughs> <laughs> Um But but also but but as I say also I'm um, I'm we're putting a lot of the focus on the contemporary v- reviews back in the day. Mm-hmm. So, um, because I always feel that's more important to actually say, well, what did the magazines back in the day review? You know, so I'm putting in large swathes of what they, you know, parts of their review. Yeah, um, it's a whole snapshot the of the period yeah. you're capturing here. Yeah. 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 I, I, I'm really excited with it. I do think it's, um, it's, I think it's the most in depth I've personally seen on, like the Amiga in terms of like all encompassing. Mm. But um, wait, more important though, mm. tell them the cost. Well, of course, it's the usual price. It's uh, free. Sweet, <laughs> sweet <laughs> <F-O>. <laughs> Um So you know, I hope it's popular with people. I, I, I'll um, I will put it on Lulu as the one I usually use where I mm. um. Because I, I always print it off for myself and then, you know, leave it at cost if people want to, you know, yep. like just what Lulu charge at cost and, uh, and and let people sort of like print out. But yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased with it. It's come, I'm about halfway through the second book. So it's really coming on leaps and bounds. And then usually what I do is I sort of like bash it out and then take a little bit of a, you know, a, a couple of days just to get clear focus. And then I will dive back to the proofreading of it and yep. uh, make sure it's all sort of like all good, all, all good. good. So yeah, so quite excited to share that. But uh, I'll keep people up to date with that. But uh, yeah, I think it's one of the best ones I've done. Actually, one of the best books. Um, the other thing I've been uh, spending a little bit of time on, although to be honest, I have you know because I'm as, as you've rightly said with um, with Zelda that if you get sidetracked, I know if I if I really get into a video game, I'm going to put the book down and then it, yeah. it'll be another project that's gathering dust. So I'm really making a, a conscious effort. No, I'm not going to play any games until I finish this book and then or, or you know play any games properly outside of the podcast but i have been playing uh dark forces remaster i've been really enjoying that have you tried it at all yeah i played the first level and thoroughly mm. enjoyed it it just took me back to when i first played it to be honest it's it, it delivers i mean it's, it's basically doing that magical thing where it's giving you your eyes back mm. of what the game looked like back in the day to you when it looked high tech right um, you play it now, the original version, you go, ooh, you know, modern monitors and whatnot else. But this, you know, being in higher resolutions and the, the audio improved and stuff like that, it just sounds, it just sounds good and plays great. I mean, Dark Forces it was always a wonderful Star Wars Doom game, wasn't it? And it's, it's, um, it's yeah. back. Yeah, I mean, I love Night Dive Studios stuff. Um, they, mm-hmm. they, you know, they're, in my mind, and in fact, both um, Digital Eclipse and Night Dive Studios are owned by Atari now, isn't it? The Whoever owns the name Atari. So they, they clearly have a retro love that they're, they're nurturing and buying these companies mm-hmm. that, that do such wonderful things. Because, yep. you know, I mean, in their own way, Night Dive Studios is, is doing what, what Digital Eclipse are taking these old difficult to uh, to access games 
and then giving it a real love and care you know they they've done hd remasters of all the cut scenes and things and yes i know there's a few not now says you know you know, they will always say oh but the force engine which is like a free add-on that you could put on um mm -hmm. does most of the same things and, and in some ways you're right but i guess this is good because it's on consoles for the first time um outside the ps1 which was a pretty dodgy yeah port back in the day it's it's now on all the modern consoles so that's great for people who want you know don't have a pc they can access it now but it, I, you know i just think overall it just has a wonderful there's a lot of touches which you don't get with the force engine and it also includes actually um an extra exclusive level that never got released it was it was used in the ces you know a computer entertainment show mm -hmm. it was a whole opening level and then it was never on the package so you know, it became a thing of sort of legend. There was people seeing parts of it, but Night Dive Studios have actually got the whole map together and uh, made it accessible as well. So you can play that long lost first showing of the game. So yeah, it's a, yeah. just nice little touches like that. It's That's lovely, good. isn't it? Anyway, so we go on to the, um, the main show itself. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. So, okay. So, you know, as I say, we've bought this compilation and we thought we would sort of like celebrate jeff minter and and obviously we, as you mentioned there's a hell of a lot of games even on the compilation and of course he's done even more than on the compilation so mm. we, we've had to take a a very selective choice of his back catalog so there might be ones on here which i you know there may be ones that people really love but i think you know given that we had to limit it by hook and crook i, th I think um i think we've got a nice eclectic selection you know, of choice more choice morsels throughout his uh, gaming yeah. developing career. Yeah. So, but let's let's talk about Jeff Minter himself because you know um, there might be people out there that don't know who Jeff Minter is, or that you know you know you know a little about him, but you know he's not he's he's not your thing. So let's just give a quick a summary of who Jeff Minter is. So he, he was born in twenty uh, second April nineteen sixty two in Reading. Um, and he now lives in Wales uh, with his partner, Ivan Zorzin, a.k.a. Giles. Um, he's an awesome programmer in his own right. In fact, they uh, collaborate now on uh, all the games and, uh, you know, they do fantastic work. You know, Giles yeah, yeah. deserves a lot of credit for a lot of his later games, uh, even though he's not on the list he's is as much as part of jeff minter's later games as he is and they live on this uh, idyllic rural farmland in wales west wales and uh, you know they've got llamas they've got two goats they've got lots of sheep, and a, a <laughs> mad border collie and he, and you know I've, I've actually been lucky to um to meet jeff uh, and giles uh, a couple of times at like a at like retro events and they're such lovely open uh, caring people and uh, i remember the last time um you know chatting to jeff and he was like excitedly showing me all his sheep the pictures of all of his sheep and he knew, knew them all by name and you're like wow <laughs> um and it's true like if you've ever gone on to his youtube uh channel uh, yes, that's all it's, it's filled it's, with is his time it's filled with, with sheep, sheep yeah, yeah. yeah no game um, well that's the game footage you have to dig deep for it but <laughs> yeah yeah um but yeah, yeah. no they're lovely guys, um, very, very talented. But but let's really sort of rewind back. So, you know, he's, he's found his love of programming at university, mm -hmm. seeing like, you know, the mainframes and things of, of, the, of the day. And uh, he then sees for sale the Spectrum ZX80 and you know then and then soon the zx81 and that just sort of blew his mind it was a it was a, a computer that he could suddenly afford in the home and that's uh, an important thing and yeah for as much as these the zx80 and 81 and other early iteration you know late 70 late 70s early 80s home micros in the uk that's a that's a, a complete change for mm. people you know i mean it would just blow people's minds and yeah we can laugh upon it now and how crude these devices are but they were important genesis machines for such programmers oh they were they were and you know he, and he started to sort of like you know play around and, and learn with the zx80 and zx81 particularly the zx81 sort of like piecing it all together mm. But then he suddenly had, he was, he was done, you know, still at uni and having to like cycle and, and do lots of things uh, to get to uni. 
and he suddenly collapsed. And um, it turned out it was, um, I remember how to pronounce it, is it pericarditis? It's basically a heart condition that he yeah. had. It's the lining, of, it's just one of those sort of like um, genetic, uh, genetic things, you know, you're just unlucky to have it. And I mean, basically that just completely, you know, it sounds like you're riddled with pain. You can't even really sit up. It's painful to sit up, let alone stand. You're, you're essentially bedridden for, for months and months, you know, while I was sort of recovering from this sort of like um, this sudden eruption on the on the lining of his heart sounds very nasty and so i imagine he's feeling quite blue i mean he's like learning still and thankfully he's, he's got a hobby with programming on the spectrum but uh you know his mum like says well come on let's go to the shops so he's obviously too weak to even leave the car but just a change of scenery and uh she comes back from the shops with a vic 20 a commodore vic 20 another computer system that's you know more expensive than the, the sinclair and you know he's he, uh, he says in like the video he's just like excitedly clutching this new device all yeah. the way home and it really would be the vic 20 although he did games on the zx81 but it would be the vic 20 that really kick-started his career Indeed. yeah absolutely and i'm not gonna go yeah there was all yeah there's other bits where he, he teamed up with a with a friend and it went a bit south but we won't worry about so much with the history you can watch documentaries on that yeah because you don't want to spoil that viewing too much yeah yeah exactly it's compelling it's compelling viewing and you're there the way it was spoken about in that part in the documentaries you were there in the car with him really visioning his his loving mother you know knowing this is his thing Mm. right and they under, there's a parent that understands their child's love and passion for this thing. I'm, you know, whereas you think of any of us, um, I mean, my, my parents were, especially my mum, she was very supportive of it. But in general, parents scorned at computers and video games, didn't they? You know, and there's yeah. this, his mum obviously worried for her son. He's going to be housebound for a while. And well, let's get him something better, something he can properly type on. Yes, I mean, the VIC-20, yeah. I mean, the VIC-20 minus the innards is, is the same keyboard as the Commodore 64, you know, it's a, a well-built mm. and very solid, proper, proper keys, people, you know what I mean? We're talking here, clickety-click-click, that's what we're talking. I mean, he can now, he can now fire, you know, fire up the code and, and get these games going in a far more um, efficient manner. Yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah, she clearly wasn't a caring mum, a mother, because it was her that actually sort of like steamrolled his friend and, and the dad that were basically ripping him off, like giving him only like 30% of of the game, even mm. though they weren't putting anything to it. She was the one that steamrolled and said, no, you're getting out of this contract. You're going alone. And at that mm. point, that's when he decided to set up the company Llamasoft. And he chose it because he loved the animal. And uh and he, he also came to know himself as Yak at this time as well. And that's he just simply nicknamed it himself because he, he's also sort of like long hair, scruffy and hairy like like a Yak. So that's why he, he chose yeah. it, in keeping with the theme. But uh, I think that's just a, a, a brief sort of like appraisal of the actual man himself. But let's go into yeah. the actual games. I think I think it's clear to say just mm. before we go into the games, one one thing consistently through his career... He's bowed to no one. He is a guy that marches to the beat of his own drum. Oh, 100%. Yeah, yes. And all the better for it, you know. And I always tip my hat to anyone that dares to be different, dares to be their own, you know, counsel well, and all these things. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, obviously, I like a lot of people, and, and throughout his career, I mean, he, he does take arcade games yeah oh and we, then, we can't deny that yeah, yeah. And, and and then sort of like does his own take on it eclectic uh, british humor type yeah twist to them, yeah, yeah nice sort of humor and twists um but i think what what's special with jeff minter and it's, it shows in all of his games that we're about to cover is he's very good at understanding and i wish more game developers could do this the importance of the gameplay loop mm-hmm. the 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 what at its core makes a game fun and he, he boils that down he's, to its essence and he, and he he's very clear about that in the documentary as well yeah. and other things you maybe see on even in bedroom to billions documentary mm. he was very clear about the gameplay loop and the core essence of a game and what makes it interesting to the player to make them come back 
for more, the addictive qualities, everything else, the replayability. Yeah, and, and I think that shows with his games. I mean, even from the very, very basic ones, the, the beginning with, right mm. the way through, all of them just have that quality. They're all addictive. You know, every single one, no matter how basic the graphics, I was like, oh, I, I, I really want to, I didn't want to put it down. That's a, that's yeah. a sign. And, and, you know, and also you get into the zone, you know, mm -hmm. where, where you suddenly like, you like, like with the classic arcade games where you, everything blurs around you and you're just completely tunnel vision into that game. And, yeah. and, and that's what's so wonderful about him. So should, should we go on to his first, the first game we're covering? Mm-hmm. Okay, so actually the first game that he wrote was Deflex, but I think we'll probably concentrate more on either Deflex V or Super Deflex. They're all essentially yeah. the same game. Um, Deflex, incidentally, was written in 1981, and, you know, it's part of the games that he released in the ZX81. He did uh, uh, 3D, 3D, and Centipede. But I think of his initial games, Deflex and particularly let's concentrate on perhaps super deflex i think the spectrum version where well which, which one do you want to do vic 20 or the i mean I, i'm more a fan of the vic 20 one to be honest okay let's yeah. go for the vic 20 they're all essentially the same idea yeah same game it doesn't yeah. matter which one yeah so it's less flickery to be yes honest, so. that's true actually i mean actually I, I do think he mastered a lot of the games actually i do prefer the vic 20 yeah version because um uh, i think he just mastered that program you know even when they were on more powerful machines like the c64 i think they were mm -hmm. better on the spectrum uh, on, on the c60 on the vic 20 um mm -hmm. so okay let's talk about deflex v the one on the vic 20 and uh, essentially it's it's a really simple idea isn't it you yeah you, uh, you have a bouncing ball and there's um, a number that you have to grab that's somewhere on there and you at any point when the ball's passing, you can press a button to create like a uh, like a swing gate, isn't it? I guess how how would you describe it? Yeah, yeah. Sort of, yeah a, swing, a deflection gate, a swing a gate, deflection yeah. gate, yeah. And and the idea is simply that you try have to try with a, with using as least of these gates as possible to bounce the gate uh, to bounce the ball into the reflecting number the gates remain and then you're ready to try again and uh, that's essentially the the gameplay loop it's incredibly addictive it's difficult to time to line up with the game isn't it and it uh, is my, my trouble is right so you've got this blank playing field as you mm. said at the beginning so the ball just moves and it'll just it'll just bounce backwards and forwards because there's nothing to deflect it in 45 degree mm -hmm. or you know opposite angles uh, no, 45, 90 degree angle, sorry. And the the, the biggest difficulty is, for me, uh, even though you can either play with the joystick or just two keys, that's all it requires, is, you know, a forward slanting deflector or a backward slanting one. So just think forward slash and backward slash on your keyboard. As simple as that, because it uses the character sets of the VIC-20. So it's getting your mind round what direction or key press produces that particular angle of deflector. That's that's the hardest bit in the game. It's mind numbing. You always pre end up pressing the wrong bloody key just when you're close to the, the target number or letter that you want to pick up. It's really, really frustrating, in a, but in a very addictive way, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's. Uh, I mean, I I love I love the simplicity of it, but it's just one that you can't stop playing. It's just got a really addictive. Although it's a simple premise, it's a really addictive premise. And of course, you're right. The the sound effects and everything is, is is really cool. And you're probably right. Deflex V is probably a better one. I mean, there's also Turbo Flex on the Atari mm -hmm. 8 bit. Super Deflex was on the Spectrum, as I mentioned, and. Um, I and mean, they're all good in their own way, but yeah, you're probably right. The um, Deflex V in 1982 was probably the the, the best one. I mean, they, they tried some things in some of the later ones where it's actually a moving object that you've got to hit, but it just doesn't need that extra level of complexity, really. Yeah, I mean, you can choose that on the VIC-20 version there, mm. where, you know, you either choose your skill level or moving targets, yes or no. It's like, I am not fighting with moving targets. I struggle enough yeah, with a static yeah. target. 
I mean, it's, like, it's a game that's clearly written in basic, okay? Mm. It's also a game you'd be very proud of if you did this within a type-in listing produced in a magazine and got this successfully running. You'd be well chuffed and very addicted. It runs at a good speed. I think if a kind of modern adaption of this was released on, say, a mobile phone, I'm, I'll guarantee it would be a surefire hit. And it, if if it wasn't for us, I mean, it's, it's amazing playing this at such an early period because we played things like a, a whole new ball game and, and other games like that. We've all played these prism games that exist on our Spectrums or Amigas or Commodores anyway, but this is the earliest iteration of this kind of concept I've I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah, I've never seen it. It's just a clever idea and it just shows that even right at the beginning he he, he had that unique ideas and, uh, and, and understood fundamentally what makes a great game. So mm-hmm. yeah, kudos to him. So, should we go on to the next game then? Is there any more you want to yes, say please. about that one? Yeah, so... No, um, no, I mean, there's very little we can say about such a game, but I think it's a very important game to begin with, just the kind of origins and, I mean, okay, done some earlier stuff, but this this was... Um, it was nice to mention Vic-20, to be honest, as a, as a system, so I'm happy with that. Yeah, so um, in, in loose order, let, let's go on to uh, Attack of the Mutant Camels then. <laughs> first one that that gave his unique humor and um of, of course really i mean i'll, I'll let you describe it because <laughs> i'm obviously yeah well talking. i was i was chuffed i mean i played this on my mates so attack of mutant, mutant camels was released on the commodore 64 in 1983 yeah if i remember correctly yep and this is important for me because i although played a lot of atari 2600 I this there's a particular game that evaded my clutches and always wanted to play, and that was the Empire Strikes Back, mm. right? So you saw it in the mags and advertised, and you so dreamt that you prayed to all the gods that ever existed that your friend that always kindly gave you a loan of his Atari 2600 <laughs> would buy this because they were as much a Star Wars nut as yourself. But they just did not, in my life, buy this Parker Brothers games. It wasn't until a good number of years later until I got my hands in it. So, because of that, my good friend across the road, he had his Commodore, went across there a lot to play it, and he had this. And it is, this is Jeff Minter's take on Empire Strikes Back, <laughs> the, the Atari version of it. And for all intents and purposes, okay, it's the same... It's, pretty much the same game where they're big giant camels um, walking towards the base that you need to protect and you fly your spacecraft to, to shoot them and um, destroy their progress. And that's really pretty much the game. But what I like about this is the zany Sid Chip sound effects in this. They're very mm. warpy and blippy and bloppy and it's, it's pure arcade sounds more than what the Atari was able to achieve so it gives a bit more just a bit more flavor to it but instead of the atats in this he's added camels walking yeah. towards that base you know and you, you just simply must shoot them now i've never been able to ascertain i don't think they've got any weak spots like they did on the atari version you just keep have to keep just shooting shoot them but them. Yeah, yeah. the bullets are bastards in this they get utter bastards they come straight for you and you move and they warp towards you so they're quite Difficult to evade and avoid, you know, but it's, it's just, I played a lot of this in my mate's house and I just convinced myself I was playing in Strikes Back. Well, because, essentially it is. I mean, uh, I mean, yeah. a- apart from in between like the sectors, isn't there? There's a few missile type things that you've got to avoid. You know, it's just a, a, a graphic swap of the ATAT for... Um, <laughs> For for a giant camel, um, which is wonderfully zany. Which the walking yeah. the walking's quite nicely animated off off the camels. Yeah, yeah, and it sort of like um, 
Atari version, it sort of changes colour, isn't it, to let you know uh, as you're getting the number of shots through and and then he mm. does a little death animation and you go on to the next one. I mean, it's it's a very basic game, uh, like the Atari one. Um, it is a shockingly... Um, I mean, I'm, he's, he's lucky that uh, Parker Brothers didn't get more upset at him. <laughs> it, yeah. uh, but it is, it's a great, you know, for people who didn't have the Atari, um, it was a great little update to that, to that game. And uh, you've got yeah. the nice star field and and the uh, the landscape in the background and uh, all oh, moves fantastically it. well, fast. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's showing off the, the hardware scrolling off the, mm. the Commodore here. Absolutely. And it's very indicative of that early period of Commodore games that I, f- I don't think the history of the Commodore should be told without mentioning a game like this, to be honest, either. Mm. You know, it's, it, it takes that kind of arcade shoot 'em up and shows that the, the, the Commodore is here to stay and can deliver games like this. And there are far better games, of course there are. But, yeah, again, there's huge nostalgia in this for me. Mm. Just, I mean, I, I'm, I'm back there, right? And... A lot of times, and I've mentioned this in previous podcasts, when my, my, my friend that had the Commodore, his grandmother also lived on the street as well. She was on my side of the road. Mm. And she was like three doors down. And often when his mum was working, he'd have to stay over there. She was looking after him. So we'd be in the spare room, upstairs. Um, the coal fire was burning in the in the bedroom. And she'd come up with cups of tea and biscuits. And you'd be up there <laughs> just playing this. You know, and it just takes you back. The sounds, the, the, the mm. visuals of this. I'm, I'm back there being, what, 8, 3, 10, 11 year old me. Yeah. At this period, you know, playing this. And just, just fond memories. And it looked, it looked so current at the time playing this it's just well i mean it's just well done i mean Mm -hmm. the thing is is he knows how to make hardware sing Mm -hmm. he really pushes does some impressive impressive things with the hardware and Mm -hmm. uh and that that's but 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 also is it's not just a tech demo he knows because he's got the skill of the gameplay loop so you've got something that's really well coded and well defined Maybe yeah. not the best graphics in the world, but it's it's functional and it has its own st- it, it has its own style. I mean, it, it, you wouldn't want it changed really to you know it has, it has its own uh, lovely look. But it, it just again that gameplay loops there, and it, it in in many ways it's probably better than um, the original. You know, the Empire Strikes Back original. It's you know it's although it's doing the same thing, it's it's got a lot more polish to it. So. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a great one. And, you know, it's around about this time as well that, um, I mean, um, the way that he, because obviously he was like a self-publishing a lot of these games himself, yeah. um, he, he would do a lot of it through, he started his new, a newsletter where there was people that, you know, that, that started to enjoy his games and, and, you know, he'd get a, like a mailing list and send them like a, a you know, a couple of, page printout of what he's up to and 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 made it a real sort of like community he was one of the first developers to really build that rapport Mm -hmm. with with the people that loved his games and therefore you know that that what they would help by word of mouth and of course he was also attending a lot of the early computer fairs um often in bristol uh, sorry often in birmingham and um and that would bring like-minded souls because there really wasn't at this time uh, very, f- you know, it was very difficult to get games on shelves and 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 to people's hands that way. It was very much almost sort of like, uh, you know, people would either go to computer events or mail order. You would send the games and they would send a check or or, or, or what have you, isn't it? And and that's very much this period of gaming in the yeah. In the Wild and West. for a, a town lad like me, you know, I mean, especially being up in Scotland, these. There were, there were there were no fairs. I suppose it would have been, but mm. not ones that I was aware of, or ones that my parents were willing to take me to. I mean, if you lived in the cities like Birmingham or London, you know the big the, the, the big metropolises, mm. that there must have been exciting things to go to back then, to just to meet the people creating the games, stack the cassettes behind them, and buy them from them even get to play them you know the tv we set up in the computer there play this game try this game sorry buy it be excited take it home what what a great time that must have been 
Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, should we go on to uh, the next game then? What we got next then? Yeah. So, um, th- this is. This is uh, a game we, you know, we are skipping over some games, but um, uh, Grid Runner, I think, is the next important game to mention. Mm-hmm. It came out in 1983, and this is an important game because this this was the game that put him on the worldwide map because he he got the interest of uh, HES Publishers, which is like an American publisher, and you know, for the Vic Twenty, and they. They were looking for games and, you know, they were blown away with this game. They were like, like coming back to him saying, um, you know, they, he mentions in, in the documentary, they got phoned up at sort of like two in the wee morning. hours of the morning. Yeah, yeah the wee <laughs> hours of the morning in America. They're excitedly saying they've been playing it all day and, and uh, that, you know, they, they want to sort of, sort of like buy and, and and I can see why. I mean, it, it's a special game. This um, wherever you play it on the Vic Twenty or the uh, the C sixty four. Which the Vic Twenty was nineteen eighty two, by the way. Yeah, so the Vic Twenty was nineteen eighty two. So it was first yeah. on. The, okay, so first on the uh, the Vic Twenty, yeah. The Vic Twenty. So um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, do you want to describe the game to our listeners? It's kind of like Centipede Plus. Isn't well, it? it's a future a futurized. Tron meets centipede, I suppose, mm. if you want to call it that, where the same concept of the centipede-like alien aliens <laughs> being, um, you know, comes down horizontally in a zigzag fashion, goes to the left, drops down a layer, moves to the right, drops down a layer, so forth, and you have to shoot it, try not to split it too much, or you, it gets a bit chaotic. But the added dimension that Jeff adds to this game is there are two spaceships on the X and Y axis on the grid and every so often where they move they emit a pulse mm. and where that pulse is they either can destroy your craft or they lay these evolving um I always called I always used to call them barrels. I don't know why I call them that, but I just for argument's sake we'll call them that. They evolve over so many stages and become mines that drop down and almost hit you as well. So basically you have to look left, right and centre in playing this this centipede clone or evolution yes. Gone is a sort of garden insectoid style of it and a real futuristic shooter um has been delivered to you. Now I used to play this with my cousin's Vic 20. Played that before ever seeing it on uh, the Commodore 64. Mm. So I've got real fond memories of this particular version. And I argue, yeah, I think it's a better game. I think I preferred it on the Vic 20 as well. The sound effects are infinitely better. And I think it runs at a better speed. Mm. It just feels feels more... Trouble is, the Vic 20 has been pushed to the limits of what it can do. I don't mean that in a bad way, right? Whereas the Commodore is kind of dragging its heels, right? The Commodore is far more capable with far more better things. And I just find it's, it runs at a great pace. It's a lot more frantic, but it's the sound effects. Mm. It looks great, but the sound effects overall just send me those nostalgic shivers. It sounds so akin to a really good arcade machine on the Vic 20. Um, yeah, the Commodore, no, agree, it's a bit actually, more, yeah. a bit more sloppier with the usage of the Sid. Mm, I, I definitely think actually it's one of the things I sort of uh, discovered, sort of playing through the games, that probably the Vic Twenty was the the, the true home of a lot of his games, the early games at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I think that's one thing that he particularly loves. You, if you look at his sort of career, like with well, you know, I've mentioned the comics and a bit and. And uh, he did the new on DVD and things. He he particularly likes the underdog hardware, the hardware that's impossible to program for that he can really mm-hmm. sort of like learn the nuts and bolts to make it shine. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and 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 I think that's why he was probably drawn to the Vic Twenty because I agree actually. Yeah, most of the Vic Twenty games, I think that was their natural home. Yeah. Uh, very good. Um, any more you want to say with uh, the Grid Runner? I mean, it's, it's, um, I, I mean, yeah. yeah, I think you could say that this is one that now is starting to show mm. that, yeah, some people argue, well, all Jeff does is takes 
other people's creations and changes them. But I, I no, yeah, this is different that, enough, is it, isn't it? It is different enough. Yeah. I mean, everything gets influenced by other things, right? Mm -hmm. there, there is truth in that. There, how many original ideas are out there in gaming now, for goodness sake, right? But he he gives it his signature. Every game, I believe, he does, he gives it his unique signature. And mm -hmm. I, I think this is hugely indicative of that, that, okay, there's this concept that clearly enjoys the gameplay of, of Centipede. But, you know, how can I make this mint edition? The idea of these, the, the X and Y Defender spaceships really make this where they just blast their beam right across the grid. It changes the game completely. Yeah, you're, you're, you're a sensory overload in this, trying to, you know, survive, destroy the centipede-like creature coming down. And you're all over the, the shop playing this. I mean, I, I thoroughly enjoyed reconnecting with, with this, to be honest. Oh, it is great. And and perhaps it's a good time to mention that on the compilation, it, it does have some of the sequels as well. Um, it's yeah. got The Matrix, which I think makes it too complex, I think, the mm -hmm. sequel. I mean, I don't know if you'd played that much at all. Yeah, the Matrix. yeah, yeah. just a little shot of it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what, what did you think with the sequel, The Matrix? Uh, it's all right, mm. right? But I'm trying I'm try to put it in the words... What I'm thinking of it. It's just like it's trying maybe a little too hard. Mm, I think to be the simplicity, honest, to be, yeah. I mean, yeah. Grid Runner is... But, but I will say, actually, the Grid Runner remastered that's on it's it. It's absolutely amazing, brilliant. isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. got all the funky visuals and all great the music. gameplay. Great yeah. music. Yeah, it's that, that's... Uh, you know, I kind of... I mean, if there's one probably... Uh, and this is me wanting the world. The disappointment if you could call it that, or, or something mm -hmm. I was hoping for. I wouldn't say disappointment. I was hoping for more remastered versions of his games. Well, that would have been good. Yeah, that would have been good. But uh, I'm, I'm thrilled with Grid Runner. It, it is uh, it's a great update, so that's just worth uh, shouting mm -hmm. out as well. It certainly makes a compilation well worth yeah. it. But yeah, no, this is this is a great one, and it was the game that really, you know, that now he was starting to be on on people's lips on both sides of the Atlantic, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, which is a rare thing, mm, to be honest. Yeah, for yeah. someone from these shores, you know, um, it's not, you know, you, you've got other people like David Crane and and such like mm. that, you know, where they're making their their, their, their pitfalls or or whatever to. To land that kind of success, and and well, well done to him. To be honest, for that, you know, it worked, and where it was correct marketing, the, the people that bought the the, you know, the rights to publish his work there and, and over in the, the states, then you know, he, he was at the right place at the right time, and it struck a chord with the right people. So good. <laughs> to the next game then okay so the next one this is a this is a, a fun unique one and it sort of ties in with his his quirky off the wall humor uh, it's hover bother hmm. and um i mean this is a lawnmower simulator game basically <laughs> <laughs> is that indeed i love this game i love this game. yeah yeah um i mean i'm gonna because you describe things so well and you you played a lot of these at the, you know, at the time Do you want oh, to it's it? take me back again it's, it's yeah. been years I mean, I've never went back to it since playing at my mate's house. Um, he had this there. And, yeah, I mean, Lawnmower Simulator, the, the the joke game that came out many years ago, um, wasn't the first iteration of Lawnmower Simulation. You're right. This yeah, yeah. this was Hover Bover. And you control the main character who, his own flymo, right, his own lawnmower, <laughs> has broken down. So he has this casual relationship with his neighbours, as you do, <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I'll just borrow. The, I'll just go near garage, and I'll borrow their their lawnmower anyway. So the basic premise is: I love the little animation. He just casually strolls up <laughs> to the red bricked house, into the garage, takes her lawnmower, 
walks back with it again, right past their living room window and everything, doesn't give a shit, does he? No. <laughs> and then it becomes a top-down view game where you have to mow the lawn. So the green areas, which look like grass... Yeah, you it's that overhead, mow. isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's top-down, yeah, overhead, yeah. yeah. And you need to avoid cutting the flower beds as well. Now, basically, there's... Well, it always looks like a lizard, but it's meant to be the neighbour's dog running about <laughs> that, um, you know, <laughs> bounces about. So basically, don't collide with that. And then they have the neighbour himself angry that you've helped yourself to his lawnmower. So he's trying to pursue you and collect it back. But if you cut the, the any of the flowers and the flower bears, even more neighbours come angrily towards you. So if you get caught, that neighbour takes his lawnmower back. So just say this. I can't remember the names. And say, Fred won't mind I'm taking this lawnmower. Um, so, as a representation of Life Centre, we'll say, Amy won't mind I'm taking her lawnmower on the next one. <laughs> um, but what's good about it, it's not just one screen. There's many different layouts of the levels and they get more increasingly difficult. But I just, I used to love playing this. It's back to a simple time, Paul. Um, simplistic gaming but it's still tough to play but oh, very addictive it's addictive yeah and I love all the little like um, you know got a line of speech uh, you know speech from the like rover kill go on boy seize kill yeah. <laughs> sending the dog after you and uh, you got your dog loyalty and mower overload isn't it and uh, yeah it's, just, yeah, it's a right. simple idea and then it's like you know you do garden after garden there's different more complex layouts as you say, really simple, very unique. I mean, this is this is a unique one. You know, unlike uh, I can't think of an arcade game that is based this on particularly. No, Not, I mean, yeah, you can't really even say Pac Man or anything. It's it stands on its own. This really doesn't. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, it, there's something very enjoyable about seeing the lawn get mowed because of course you see the rough grass and as you progress it's that lovely sort of like just just uh smooth, smooth like basic cut smooth green cut color green. yeah and yeah. Uh, so you can see exactly where where you're going it's just yeah really nice uh nice game on the c64 and uh, uh very unique it's one that I, I, I do in you know playing it i mean it's not one that i really played back in the day um mm -hmm. I'm aware of it, but uh, yeah, playing it for the show, I had a lot of fun with it. Once I once I got, I found that dog's a bit annoying. <laughs> he can dog go lizard, the yeah, <laughs> yeah, the dog lizard. Uh, but he goes at a hell of a pace. Um, so it's, I think it's one that you probably once you've learned some of the patterns, you can get a lot. You know, it's a lot easier to you know once you work out. Yeah, I don't remember these games being as much difficult um, as mm. as a kid as I, I now do find them in my adult years. I was like, my God, was it was this game as difficult? But um, probably was. But it's and that I would I would never be the greatest game on earth. But I'm, I'm I just sat with a smile, reminiscing mm. yet again, being at my mate's house, playing stuff like this, and going well. Because it was very different from games I had on my Spectrum. So that pleased me even more. There was no point... I mean, I had tons of mates that had Spectrums. You go to the house and play games. But I thought it was more exciting going to his, a friend's house that didn't have your system. And they were mm. showing you games they liked that were very different. And this this is part of this for me. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a unique one. Very British. And it's uh, just, just fun, isn't it? It's just a fun yeah. idea. And, uh, yeah, he just came up with the idea. They saw a mower outside, wasn't it? And then thought, yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> That's, that might be a good game. I, th I think it would be one that... Uh, I'm surprised. I bet someone has done, like, a modern... Uh, lawnmower simulator you've got power wash i'm sure there's one that's done lawnmower. yeah but it's back to that we spoke about on trash man on the top 100 yeah. it's just a, a lesson in mundanity and gaming isn't it yeah yeah although although this is definitely more arcade route than mundanity it's it's building yeah, on the yeah. arcade route it's not uh, yeah but yeah. it is it is very satisfying work your way through but my god it was tough <laughs> <laughs> fantastic so we go on to the next game then yep right a 
Okay, so the next game, I really, really love this, uh, particularly on the VIC-20. Again, I preferred it over the C64 version. And it's called Laser Zone. It's another 1983 game. And it's a really simple idea. You have on the horizontal and vertical plane a ship on each on each sort of like imagine like a graph isn't it and you and you can move left and right and fire and also up and down and fire mm-hmm. and the idea is is that you have to take out all the aliens so you can you know it's, it's sort of a little bit patting your head and rubbing in that you're trying definitely to, that yeah yeah definitely do the moving but i found with the first iteration it just worked fantastically well you you can also if they come to the to the wall that you're on either vertically or they start yep. moving down now you it, you can wrap around and um or tilt you or, can tilt yeah. the angle of the so if something's on the the horizontal wall you can mm. tilt the angle to 45 degree of the vertical wall and shoot yeah. down and vice versa it's a bit fiddly to get that button and angle right i wasn't i discovered that by accident because this game's new to me i would mm. never played this before and it came came to me by accident because sometimes the, the instructions are so wordy and in, in his games trying i just can't be arse reading them he's like oh, yeah, come yeah, on. Yeah. <laughs> tell, tell me the basic concept please but what a game this it's is great. cracking i love it yeah this is one of my because i'm like you uh, it, this was new to me mm-hmm but I, I just really, really found it so addictive. It just, particularly on the Vic 20, I, I felt on the C64, it was arguably better graphics, more complex graphics. But yeah, I, I satellite found, dishes and yeah, stuff, satellite stuff dishes like, yeah. instead of yeah. the ship. But I just thought the purity of the Vic 20 version mm-hmm. just uh, kept me. Yeah, Kept me going with. It. I mean, I mean, did what about you? What did you think of the C sixty four version? It's fine, but I'm my heart's with the Vic twenty yet again. Mm. I find it. I think maybe it's just because you you think better of the C sixty four, and think less of the Vic twenty. Maybe maybe that's part of it. But I, I found it was more of a game on the Vic twenty version. I liked just the dark shaped ships, the simplistic um, graphics that were coming towards you, the bat, the skull. That's pretty much about it, to be mm. honest. Didn't need the the pizzazz to give me a, an addictive game because the gameplay was there that delivered that anyway. The idea of, as you said, patting your tummy and rubbing your head and vice versa of that. Mm. I, I can't think of an, another game where it's like independent limb movement, where your brain, you know, you have to think up and down as separate controls, controlling a different vehicle. And, and left and right on a, on the, the other plane. It's it's really good fun. And, I mean, ultimately, it's like he's been inspired by his own grid runner and mm. the, the two spaceships on the X and Y grids. He's thought, you know what? I think that will make a decent game. And he's bloody right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, really good. I just, I, yeah, I really feel he was coming into, like, in the, in the early years, this is really special. I mean, both Laser Zone and uh, th- this next game, which I think it has the best name ever. It's called Metagalactic Llamas Battle the Edge of Time. <laughs> Love that title. 1983. And and this was another one that I absolutely adored. I have played it before, but I, I, I couldn't tell you where. Or maybe I probably pay, played like a knockoff version maybe. But this, okay. this really impressed me. Idea of it is nice and simple again. You have these alien spiders coming down, and you're a llama. And the idea is is that you can, um, you can. There's a force field which you can move up and down. So you got that. I discovered that too late, by the too way. Too late, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you, so you can move the you can move the force field up and down. And the idea is is you have to shoot at and kill the spiders. Now, the your laser that comes out of your llama's eyes, obviously. Um, <laughs> you have laser firing uh, uh, llamas, of course you do. And um, the idea is is you have to like ricochet off the shield to either shoot the spider directly, that would be the ideal, or shoot, if you shoot the uh, the string, like the web, that the, the spider's coming down on, 
then the spider will fall and bizarrely turn into this weird like wormy yep. thing i don't know why it turns <laughs> into a wormy thing but hey because it does because it does and and that's the concept really you move left and right you've got obviously got to dodge and and of course you can shoot the wormy things as well by also ricocheting the shots and i love it because you've obviously got the skill of working out the ricochets that's always a, a, a you know, it makes you feel warm and fuzzy getting a good like ricochet shot off and 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 mastering it but it is frantic it's fun again yep. i thought it played better on the uh the vic 20 it did. <laughs> I, I feel really bad here because everybody's like oh you always don't mention the c64 and here we are about the vic 20 but it's there's just nothing wrong with the 64 tree. version it's just yeah. so good on, yeah yeah I, 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 I just spent more time going back to the Vic Twenty version. It seriously, I, did. I, I just I think I think genuinely he'd spent he'd at this point he'd completely mastered the Vic Twenty. Yeah, it was his machine of, of love, and and all of them, all the other versions that came out of these various things and and things. I think they were inferior, including on the Spectrum. They were inferior. Yeah. The Vic Twenty was is is his home really. He's made way. some of the best games that the Vic Twenty is. Never mm. had. Well, it all runs so perfectly, isn't it? I mean, it all yeah. runs. I mean, if you saw this in the arcade, even in. Like I was about to say that. This yeah. is an arcade game. Mm. Pure and simple. This is. He has defined an arcade game for the Vic 20 or the Commodore, but primarily this was yeah. a focus here. And if this was released, you could you could picture this being an Atari game. Yeah, easily 100%. in the arcade. I mean, this would have been huge, and I think in the arcades if it had, if it was released. You know, yeah, maybe mm-hmm. like you know, um, yeah, even in eighty three. I mean, I mean, maybe the, it'd be struggling a little bit in eighty three, but you know, um, eighty two or something, just a year before. But, mm. Yeah, but imagine we let's say Atari Pokey Chip mm. audio yeah, and stuff like that. Good. You you would have been hooked on this playing this yeah. game. The the whole survival screen wrap around deciding the height of the deflector bar and and. Because there's no name a game that, that you don't get. Basically, you're not playing with direct shots towards the enemy you're trying to kill. Mm. I'm trying to think of anything else. It's pretty unique in that way. No, I mean it's it's, it's sort of almost the concept that things like puzzle, bubble, and bust move and things mm. like that sort of like yeah, yeah. Uh, champion later on. But I mean, this has yeah. definitely got the more shooty arcade roots. Yeah, no, I I, I really this and Laser Zone. I think we're we're two of the standouts <laughs> that I didn't know that well I think of all the games so right. yeah really really enjoyed this and it again on the compilation it, it, it the emulator of doing the Vic 20 just does such a good job this is mm-hmm. one that um, I wanted to play a lot more of um, but again I uh, well as I mentioned I, if, if I get too addicted to any of these games then the book is going to get put on ice and <laughs> <laughs> There's a fine balance, mate. It is, it is. Um, so, any more you want to say on this one? I think it's absolutely no. I, it's, I'm, I'm with yeah. you. I'm, I find it, I find it one of the highlights, and one I wasn't actually aware of at all. Never played this in my life before. This one, it's new to me, and I just, yep, yeah, I'm sold. Yeah, yeah, really, really good. Okay, so should we go on to the next game then? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Now, this again actually was a very early title. It went through lots of iterations, but I thought I thought partly because I knew that we weren't mentioning the C sixty four as much as I thought we would. Be. Um, I as thought, hoped we would. Yeah, uh, I thought uh, we should mention the particularly the Rock sixty four R O X sixty four, another nineteen eighty three game. But it did come out. Uh, you know, this was Rocks three. It came out on a different system. Concept is really simple. You're on a on a like lunar planet you've got your little lunar lander and there's um meteorites coming down at the lunar planet of your like lunar base and you have three directions you can shoot so you can either shoot left sort of like 45 degrees directly above or right 45 degrees so it's all about timing your shot to take out to take out the meteorite if the meteorite lands, then it causes a bit of seismic damage, and if it it basically makes a hole in the lunar lander, and it, uh, sorry, a hole in the lunar landscape, 
And if enough holes or enough hits of the lunar landscape happens or it hits the bottom, you know, as it makes the hole, then the whole, you know, your lunar base blows up because there's too much seismic yep. uh, damage. You also have three panic buttons, which means if you've missed it and you know, oh God, I'm going to die, you can hit the panic and it will destroy everything. You know. When did it stop or at any point? I always just call that smart bomb. That's what I always yeah, used to Yeah, but it is. It. I guess as you say, you just called it panic, <laughs> panic bomb. Uh, it's kind of like that. Oh, I missed it. And it is, it's just, again, really simple idea. And it does have that kind of addiction that you have with Missile Command, which is kind of, you know, again, he's taken a very loose idea of an arcade game like Missile Command, but made it his own thing. It is a totally different game. But there is something satisfying about, you, you and you do get better with timing your shots so you do get that feel of when to fire the shot to sort of take them and you know when once you've taken out quite a few of these meteorites you're feeling really good about yourself and i think that's why it was i i, I quite liked it was because it is you know it's not pushing the c64 at all um no. it clearly got its older roots on like the other systems the earlier systems but i thought I, yeah i thought it was a lot of fun i thought it was a lot of fun simple but addictive fun i mean what did you think about this one I mean, I had reasonable fun with it, um, mm. but I do prefer Missile Command over this and always will do. Yes, yeah. Um, I think it's the weakest game from our selection in this episode. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I yeah. will say it, it does nothing to say this is a Commodore 64 game. Yeah. In, in that way, I'm afraid. Um, but I sat there and played it, and 10 minutes later, I'm still playing it. 20 minutes later, I'm still playing it. So what does that say about it? It's got its addictive <laughs> loop, and that's kind of why I, I wanted to... Um, yeah. I wanted to mention any of the Rocks ones, just because I think it's got a very fun gameplay loop. And yeah. uh, it's one that, you, you, as you described, like, you know, you're just, oh, I'll just have one more go, and oh, I, I got that score. Let me let me just see if I can get that a little bit higher. It's definitely got mm -hmm. that built in. So I wanted to give it a little shout-out, because it's no, no, one I'm that, actually. personally, I've, I've never played really i don't never heard of rock 64 there's no i've never heard of it no. ones. yeah right okay so um i thought we'd take a little uh a little side look because it's sort of ran about this time um because of course the other thing that jeff minter has become known for or perhaps people don't realize that he's known for is um his light synth software mm -hmm. so there's three principal ones. So in, in this era, around about 83, um, you had Psychedelia, uh, or Psychedelia, which came out on the VIC-20, the Spec E, C64, and MSX. And it was like the, the first light synth program that I'm aware of. You know, it's sort of... Uh, I mean, it's quite impressive, some of the effects. I mean, I mean, did you play around with the Psychedelia at yeah. all? Or, yeah. yeah. What, what did you think? Uh, yeah, well, I needed about 10 pints of cider before I played it, and then had great fun. But, um, no, I, I quite like these things, to be honest, um, Paul. I, mm. I, I muck about with them and just appreciate. You have to go back then. As what, what what I was making these early computers do was flare off arrangements of colours uh, mm. and, and patterns according to how you mucked about with the screen. And, yeah, that is very tech demo, eh, I suppose, in, in some ways, but... It was bloody fun, you know what I mean? Because you were just impressed by making any of your computers do do visuals. I was happy doing writing in basic mm. and tell my computer the spectrum that I had to draw a couple of circles in the boxes and felt proud that I'd done plot and pie in the syntax correctly. So this is a far more far more advanced version of that, to be honest. So yeah, I'm I'm, I'm always a I'm always a bit of a mucking about with stuff like that, to be honest. Yeah, and, and you know, he did, um, you know, as you say, did Tripatron on the Amiga and mm -hmm. ST. I, I think, I, I think the uh, side, like the uh, psychedelia was more impressive, but then it, you know, it was just, uh, I, I never felt he really utilized the Amiga and ST to its full potential. It was not, not one that yeah. he particularly. Uh, gravitated towards necessarily um but, but of course the one that he is famous for is on the xbox 360 you had neon which is uh the built-in uh yeah. light synth and he did that so if ever you've like if you boot up your 360 and and, and try the built-in sort of like you know with music tracks and all the funky effects that's him doing it there mm. isn't it so 
I, I just felt it, it's, it's not one I wanted to spend a lot of time on, but I, I just thought it would be one that I think was worthy of a mention because he mm. really was at the forefront of doing a lot of these light synth, you know, the idea, that, that concept of, of doing light displays in tandem yeah. with the music that's playing. And I, I yeah. think, uh, yeah, very, very good. Good, good. <laughs> Okay, so shall we go on for the uh, the next games in the series? Yeah. So the next game that I thought we would mention is uh, the sequel to Attack of the Mutant Camels. It is Revenge of the Mutant Camels. So the, they're out for revenge here. And this time you play the camel himself. And you have uh, laser firing camel, because of course, of course it is. There's lots of craziness. There's lots of like alien attack birds and things attacking <laughs> you uh you have pyramids with like the eye of horus eye and uh, lots of little characters and uh, things wandering up and the idea is you've got to direct your shot and shoot them all isn't it that's basically it i mean do you want to describe it a little bit more for alice yeah definitely i mean i think it's hard to i mean would we say this is inspired slightly by moon patrol maybe perhaps it's a continuous mm. scrolling yeah, it's mm, he goes. Mm. Yeah, it's hard to tell what it's inspired by. I love this personally, though. Yeah, it's a great I, I, game. I mean, it's got like a. It's very British. You've got like a telephone, phone booths and. Oh, it's got it's got nonsense all the way yeah. through it. Absolutely, but I just love the the closest I had to this for me was Cosmic Kanga on the Spectrum. If you ever mm. recall that game, Paul. No, no, which I, I loved. Know, yeah. I, I love these games where. It continues to move along, but you can control the speed of your creature. So the, the llama, the llama, the camel, and and this one, as you're moving along, and um, you can go to the front of the screen, back of the screen, and the game just chucks at you the most zaniest of creatures in, in every level yeah. possible. One, so one minute there's over Pac-Man and ghosts. And... Oh, <laughs> it just chucks everything at you, and it's just zany and it's bonkers. I think this is. This is Minter at this point. He's most eclectic, mm. to be honest. You know, he's he's just chucked everything in that he loves in gaming and delivered this surreal Monty Python esque shooter with there's there's cigarettes and tobacco hurling towards you in some levels where you need to shoot. They mo- they do look more like tampons and hairy balls, but <laughs> I understand what they're trying to trying to um, depict here. But no, I've. I have a lot of fun memories playing this at my mate's house as well. I, I just, it, it's, it's a basic shooter, very tough, but mm. the addiction is in this is each and every level is different in terms of what alien is going to or body is going to come towards you. That's the real does, only change does draw in the you, game. It does draw you on, and I love how each new wave tells you what the wave's called. You know, like mm-hmm. aggressive Australian Al- uh, Alpidus, uh, or something like mm-hmm. that. Something, some daft name, isn't it? And and, and it's yeah. nice. The idea is because yes, you 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 can either walk or you can jump, and and of course with you directing your shot, there, there's a mm-hmm. lot of control of where you can fire your shot. So it's yeah, how you how good you are if it is a different kettle of fish, to be honest. Yeah. But I, I'm, I can't say I'm necessarily good at. At least there's an option on. The, not in all the games in the Minter collection, but if you go into game options when you pause the game, you can actually put infinite lives on on a good number of the games. So I did fire that on in this, to be honest, I'll confess. But mm. that did not take away the enjoyment of all the zany creations that were going to appear in each of the levels. 
There's even ZX Spectrums and different 8-bit computers you can shoot and even further levels. It's just, it's full of, there's so many sprites in this game that probably took up a lot of the memory <laughs> in the mm. computer in the Commodore. And there is one thing I would say, actually, is that th this is one that I think is best on the C64. The, um, oh, absolutely. The, the, there is an Amiga and an ST version, but it's, it's not very good. So, yeah, this, this is the one that I would definitely uh, mm. recommend be, be the one to play. This is, a, I'm not even sure if the, if, it was, if the Amiga ones was actually done by Jeff Minter. Whether it was just like a, a love letter to, but mm. I, either way, the the C sixty four is the only one that you should play. I think it's full of zaniness, as you say, and I just love that it's one of those whether it's going to be exploding sheep or or whatever. Every, every every new wave makes you want to play on see yeah, what the hell absolutely. That, is going to come out the... of his head next. Yeah, <laughs> um, I'm convinced this is when Minter goes to sleep at night. This is what he dreams of. Yes, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. This is this only only Jeff could come up with a game like this. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Shall we go on to the next game? Talking of mad, uh, mad games, um, I thought the next game that we should mention, and I do realise we are skipping over, there's probably people spitting murder of, you know, we're missing out games like, I don't know, uh, Tracks and and things mm -hmm. like that and Hellgate, but, and, and, and you know, there's some that I think we are going to miss out on, like, you know, uh, uh, Battlex and, 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 and things and Mama Lama, but Again, we had to like come up with a list <laughs> uh, for our own sanity, not just yeah. our listeners. Um, but I thought Sheep in Space was uh, another interesting one because it's um, it's basically a horizontally scrolling shooter where you play a sheep and you can. Well, it's just another mad shooter, isn't it? You you do you, do you want to describe it to our listeners because I think you're in a better position to describe. Yeah, this madness. I, I mean. He always claims this is his defender or mm. his answer to defender. Yeah. And it is, and you see that, but the scrolling and the speed of this game and the way that you can quickly and rapidly change directions actually more reminds me of Iridium. Yes, to be I was saying, well, Iridium springs to mind, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's got yeah. the ideas and you've got the camels and things and things. On the, oh, it's, it's got all this nonsense, minted stuff. But basically, the game is sectored into. Three different horizontal zones in the game. So there's a kind of fast zone in the center where the sheep just whizzes along. You can zap all the aliens. And the idea is to clear the, the waves, mm. you know, kill everything in the skin. There's no humanoids that are getting kidnapped like in Defenders. So there's, there's none of that. So there's more a closeness to Iridium. Just kill everything that is there. But if you go nearer the edges on the top and the bottom, you slow down and the, the sheep goes side on. And you see the little legs. But what is really cool about this, there's grassland, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, and you get yeah. to land in these patches of, of, of land where, because the sheep gets hungry. Yeah, the sheep's yeah. a very hungry creature and you get its status on the screen going, sheepy need foodie. Famous. <laughs> How full the sheep's stomach is. Yeah. Full, ravenous and all the rest. So you must also land on the patches of grass that you discover. Slow down, slow down and land gently think like lunar lander or whatever things like that. land down in that grass let sheepy munchy and continue on the shoot fest brilliant shoot em up bizarrely created sometimes you wonder the saleability on the international market of some of 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 mentor stuff you know does this have the international appeal i don't think of, he's um, ever cared about the international he markets or, or he, does he not just cares about monkeys, yeah. what he wants to make and if yeah. people don't want to play it so be it that's uh yeah, but it, but that's what makes him so wonderful. It is it's just unique, crazy, but but not just a crazy, unique, and madcap idea. But because he's got the the 
programming prowess behind it it's also a really solid game isn't it it's, yeah you know and again this is like you know really showing what the commodore 64 now we're getting in the period where the commodore is the c64 is the best version you know that you for it isn't it uh, yeah. well, in fact, the only version is in this particular game. But I mean, th- what I mean is, is that I mean he's putting out there some of the best of the C sixty four. I think for speed and and, and interesting ideas, it's, it's it's a great one. I, I had a lot of fun with this. This is one again. I really want to spend some more time with because I haven't had. I I I know of the game, but I've not spent that much time with. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sheep in space and a and again, what, what a fantastic! It's game. so fluid and fast. It's ridiculous, mm. isn't it? It really shows off that you know when the Commodore does fast scrolling like that, and there's just everything going on. You you know you're playing a Commodore game, and that this 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 shows this off, and it's it's, it's superb. It's just bonkers in, in every step of the way, but such fun as well. Yeah, no, I love it. I mean, any more you want to say on that that one? No, nah, I'm good with that, mate. I think it's good. I've, um, yeah, and uh, now there are some that we just don't have time. As I mentioned, I think Battlelix is an amazing one as well. Um, that's that in particular. There's a lot that we're missing out on, but um, and Mama Lama I think is an interesting one. But let's go on because I think this was this was a, one that I was particularly excited for. Not necessarily that it's um, it's particularly the greatest game on this list. But it was unreleased. So basically you had uh, the Conic system, which mm. uh, Jeff Minter was quite involved with, with making sort of games. And this was on the cusp between the 8 bits and the 16 bits. And it was a very exciting idea. It was actually done by Conic's, the controller people. And yeah, everyone uh, remembers the Speed King Speed controller. Speed King, yeah, and things like that. Yeah. And the idea was, was it would be like you, you could... You could do. I'd, I'd love somebody would come out with it today, really. But you know, it'd be a steering wheel that you could plug in, and and then you'd have like for driving games, or you could put the joystick in. It was all sort of like interconnected, so you could put different controllers to uh, to play all these different games on this, you know, gaming rig, basically. And um, as I say, the the, the Connex is one that's never got released. I mean, I think they realised slush run out of money before they'd even begun but they realized that you know the, the world had moved on really by the time of the conic so they didn't even bother releasing the machine and but it was something that jeff had made a game on and he mm-hmm. basically did the, the attack of the mutant camels uh, but the conic version but it's a very different beast isn't it it mixes in the fendry elements and you've got i mean do you want to describe it I'm not yeah really i mean it, it, today. it has a it has that kind of Atari ST and Amiga aesthetic mm. to it, where you have that, you know, that, that gradient hue of color from bright oranges to blue, you know, moves up to just give us a sunset or sunrise appeal. But albeit the play field is rather short of the cameras, because the cameras are coming through a, a warp gate into the Egyptian existence. Mm. But to take a game, like you said, a little bit of Defender, Gradius Elements, mm. because you can choose your different bullets from the the icons below when you you, you do the collector maps but i think it is visually absolutely impressive but i think this is a decent take on camels altogether not like the the 16-bit computers i actually really enjoy playing this game a hell of not because well, you can this is one of the few you can play it on emulation yeah, well, this is why I was so. I mean, I've never, I've never seen if there's a Conix uh, emulator, but I was really. Yeah, there, there is one out there. Mm. There is one out there where there's, there's only a couple of games I believe you can actually play. But to play this on the the main system, well, it doesn't matter then. There's probably no point in firing up the emulator for the the sake sake of the the scant few things you can play. But this handles well. It looks bloody great, mm. and. See that day and night cycle where you see the sun setting in the yeah, background yeah, yeah. in the game. 
how amazing is that? It's, I, I think there's quite a wholesome game here, which uh, has a natural evolution of his concept of camels. He's kept uh, the core gameplay of it, but evolved it in a, a very clever way, I think, personally. Mm, yeah, I mean, he clearly puts a lot of labour of love and uh, must be frustrating for him because he's had, obviously, quite a few cancel games over time you know i mean or or games on systems that nobody bought like the new on dvd system do you remember that where he did tempest yeah. 3000 yeah yeah i mean and but i think yeah he, ne he never necessarily goes for the commercial reasons to make a game it's like oh tough tough hardware to crack that that i think is is sort of like uh is catnip isn't it or sheep nip yeah, <laughs> sheep yeah. Dip, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I liked it. I liked the idea with the pendant and you sort of like uh, having to sort of like drop those off and things like that. And yeah, there's a lot going on here. Uh, it it might be a little bit garish when you first look at it, but it, like with all of um, of Jeff Minter games, once you start playing it, it it uh, that assortment on your eyeballs is actually what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah, the thing is, when I first fired it up, I didn't look what system it was on. I just fired the game and played it. I went, oh, this is this must be the Atari ST version. Mm. I just naturally assumed that straight away. It, was, it wasn't until I exited that I realised that it was saying the Connex system. I went, oh, yeah. right. I, I, I knew, I just thought it was a complete vaporware thing. I didn't actually appreciate there was anything ever really released on it, you know what I mean? And I didn't know. I was ignorant that mentor was involved with it it's, it's certainly a, a machine that didn't yeah it's a lovely picture i'll i'll, I'll dig it up for the video mm -hmm. version where there's mm -hmm. jeff minter sat in the conix it's probably pretty much the only picture of the conix and you've got jeff sat in the conix chair with all the <laughs> controllers uh, i wonder if we got to keep the prototype i wonder <laughs> yeah yeah but um <laughs> but yeah no this is this is a fun one and it was one that i was particularly excited for all the compilation because i love discovering these sort of like unreleased games and seeing uh, you know what could have been and you know based on this i mean yeah i mean the conics was giving visuals of uh, up there with amiga and st you're right you know so it, it it could have been an interesting idea with the controller you know it's a shame that it, it didn't get released the conics looking at this but i get the feeling that probably a lot of programmers not up to jeff's standard would mm. have uh, not been able to get this kind of things out of the conics i mean what he's doing mm. here is probably right at the edge of what the conics could do yeah very impressive mm. i urge anyone to try try that if you've if you've got the bought the collection mm. and try this out or i mean as i said there i believe that this can be emulated so um see if it's out there if you just want to you know curious about it and give it a try I, i'm well impressed yeah, yeah, no, I love uh, love this one. So, uh, should we go on to the next game then? And uh, this is this is a fun one. This came out in would it be 1992, uh, 1991 oh, and getting, 1992. Yeah, we're getting on. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and and I realise, yeah, we've missed a lot out of here, but that's what we do. We've missed out Super Grid Runner and and uh, Yaks. Progress we've covered Grid Runner, Runner, so the concept yeah. has been covered. You know. Yeah, so. and, but I'm, I'm probably the only one that I probably, as I mentioned, that Battle X is the only one that I feel. And Mama Lama are probably the two that I've, maybe Void Runner as well. There, all of his games are good, but then that's the point. You go out and just our point was to just give you a, a, a morsels of um, of some of the favourite cut yes. choices, and then hopefully let you dive into his other games. But um, uh, yeah, Lamatron twenty uh, twenty one twelve or two one one two. I don't know how how do you want to say it. Um, 2112, because it's coming from Rush. 2112, yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah, because it's Rush reference, isn't it? That's, that, that's yeah. it, yeah. Um, so, essentially, what is it? It's Robotron, basically. But again, <laughs> you play, I don't know whether it's a camel or it's a llama, isn't it? You play a little llama, and uh, you have to shoot all the enemies and, yeah, 
It's basically Robotron. It's his version of Robotron. It runs. Oh, it's incredible. Runs fantastic, and um, again, you have a nice different uh, range of enemies. Um, you're rescuing other llamas, and it's just craziness. It's wonderful, and and of course, what probably people don't appreciate, um, and I remember this came out. I think it was. On the Amiga, it was like a PD game. I remember it on cover disc. It wasn't like mm-hmm. a commercial release. Um, and I remember just being loving this because you didn't have Robotron or, or games like that on the machines, like the, the, the Amiga and things. And, and I, you know, I always loved, I was always drawn to these older games because um, mm-hmm. I, I wasn't lucky as you to have a lot of these games on my doorstep. And, uh, yeah. and of course, in 1992, no one would have had these games on their doorstep because long uh, gone, long yeah. gone. But um, yeah, this is just a really solid, lots of cool sound effects, just as good on the ST or or the Amiga. I think he reprogrammed the one on the Amiga because the one that someone did a port of wasn't very good. But it it just plays really, really solid. I mean, what, what do you want to say about this one? Yeah, I'm, I'm the same here. Now, what I like on the version on this, I don't know if it's just been adapted for us, I don't know if the ST or the Amiga allowed for ju- two joysticks um, in either port, I don't know. Mm. Um, I can't remember because I certainly only played it with one back in the, the day and, and absolutely loving it, you know, because the sound effects are bang on. Mm. The, the fluidity and the handling it, it's just... It's, it, it, it just gave you Robotron with weirdness, mm. which is no bad thing. Um, so, yeah, you, you had, for all intents and purposes, a game that handled like it. But what I'm getting at is, on this version on um, the pack here, you can do twin-stick shooter if you've got an analog stick in, right? Which makes it all the better. So mm. I'm what I'm asking you, Paul... As do you know, to your knowledge, were you able to ram two joysticks saying, and it worked as a twin stick shooter back in the day? No, I don't or is this uniquely being programmed in by whomever to make it work just for this compilation part? I don't, I don't rem- well, I might be wrong, but I, because uh, I just played the compilation version, but because I'll be going for hazy memories, but I don't remember having the option to do twin. Yeah, stick. it works even freaking better because uh, I then. Because I was doing it, I just had a, you know, a, an Xbox One controller plugged in mm. um, and playing it with that. But like, well, I was, to be honest, like with most of the games, I was getting thumb exhaustion because back in the day when you were playing it, you could have had it on your desk and weren't using your thumb, you were using your sort of, you know, a couple of fingers on the, your qu- quick shot or, or whatever you were using for your, you know, a, a pro joystick or whatever. I ended up plugging my arcade stick in, my, May, my Mayfair arcade stick and playing these games and see to have twin stick and oh my god it's just incredible it's day and night playing properly like how the arcade version was and realizing even more how how accurate this version is now yeah you get extra bullet additions don't you and you get freeway bullets and stuff like the arcade didn't have but it's just absolute pure fun and this needed to be mentioned I, i think he really captured the spirit and didn't pretend it was anything different mm. apart from a, a blatant Robotron inspired clone. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I always love this game. It's just, as mm-hmm. you say, it's just a, yeah, this is probably, because as I was saying, we were saying offline really, you know, in a lot of ways, Jeff Minter was somebody I'd, you know, because I came from the Spectrum background and then the Amiga, Jeff Minter was. A name that you knew because it was often revered on the magazines of the day. Yeah. Um, but I didn't quite get why he was revered as much because I didn't really come from a C64 background and, you know, things like Hover Bother and things like that passed me by. And a lot of the, uh, you know, the early Spectrum games passed me by as well. And I didn't have the exposure to the others. So for me, Lamatron took. You know, uh, 2112 or 2112 did you say it's Rush is it 2112 is that what it is 2112 2112 uh, so Lamatron 2112 is that was the first one that I was like oh now I'm now I get what this you know why he's so heavily revered and of course when we come to the next games that's when I went from this guy 
is deservedly revered to wow this guy's a genius and mm. we'll come to those in the next stage <laughs> Okay, so we're coming up to his more modern games, and this is personally, as I mentioned from before, as uh, the time when I really fell in love with uh, Jeff mm. Minter. Uh, personally, I mean, I've, I've come to appreciate his previous stuff, but I just didn't have the exposure. But I, I mean, for me, actually, the, the time I first played it was on the Saturn, but of course, it first came out and less known the version that he did was on the uh, the Atari Jaguar. It is, of course, Tempest 2000, released in 1994. And uh, this is basically, well, it's a Atari update that only Jeff Minter could do of the game Tempest. And yeah. he's not only put, not only do you have the amazing soundtrack that's uh, been produced for the game, but he's he's... And, and of course, you've got the wonderful trippy visuals and the the, the speech of the uh, the computerized lady telling you, you know, all the power ups and things. But he's put in so much more to the game, hasn't he? He's put in uh, there's um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure everybody knows Tempest. The idea is it's like a tunnel based shooter. There's monsters coming up. But the thing that he's added is he's added like power ups that you can pick up if you kill some of the enemies you'll see like a power up coming up towards you that you can pick up you still have your zap but there's other things like power ups you can pick up for jumps that you can do so you can temporarily jump to avoid the enemy and it, it for me this is the best game that he's ever done i i just adore tempest 2000 i love the power ups i love the trippy visuals i love the music it all works so well together and I, I just never ever tire of it. And of course, the thing I love with um, it's both on the both on the Atari compilation that Digital Eclipse did, uh, but also this. But they they've actually made the version run at uh, sixty frames per second, which it never did originally, and just you know made it smooth as butter. And, and of course, with the modern controllers, it just plays so well. I mean, what what did what do you think of this game? Right. My my mate had a son his Jaguar and it was funny, as much as I played the, the snares and, and, and all the rest, we bought he bought the Jaguar on the very same day as I bought a SNES for myself, right? For whatever reason, there was a a video rental shop that also was selling and renting games, but it was selling off hardware. And I can't remember the year that I mean, it must have been. Well, yeah, the Jaguar didn't like, last that long, really, did it? It, it didn't. It must have been that period. As much as I played the SNES, I got it, you know... It's weird, you, you know, in your memories, and you're thinking, oh, is that that timeline? Is that correct? Did I imagine this? But we bought them on the same day, basically. He didn't buy the. He didn't buy this on the same day. He bought this later when it came out, right? Mm. So but he, we bought, there was only one SNES and one Jaguar, so he decided... He wanted that because he was sold on the Atari name. And I was like, mm -hmm. and, and I bought the SNES. So I was a very happy man. But there was us happy with our own individual consoles here. And 
I didn't. I wasn't really envious of the Jagger overall. I had a couple of decent games, but nothing that you know made made me yeah. cry about. I chose the wrong thing. But when he got this, I was super envious. I mean, not only is Tempest the best game in the Jaguar, not only is Tempest Jeff Minter's best game, but I think it's one of the best in the original trippy shooters that's ever existed. Mm, no, I totally right? agree. Yeah. yeah. And there's been many people that have emulated that design since this that to much great effect, but still does not beat how impressive this game is. He has taken that excellent vector game that was always an incredible arcade game anyway, given a, a more solid visual, we're giving it retro wave, solid Phil Hughes down the, the tunnels mm. with it, that fantastic soundtrack and delivered a career best. Um, and I was at least delighted then when it came out as Tempest X on the PlayStation 1 that I can continue my, my playing off it. And it's still one of my favourite PlayStation games, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I'm just the same way. I mean, I didn't know anybody that bought the Jaguar back in the day. So my first exposure to it was actually the Saturn port, which was pretty solid, same as the uh, the PlayStation port. I, I, you know, obviously, I've since I've bought every version <laughs> that's, well the only one I don't have and I kind of regret is as I mentioned the Tempest 3000 that he did on the DVD Neon and I remember seeing yeah. the DVD Neon f like being sold off in Woolies do you remember Woolworths? Yeah, remember yeah. that shop? Bless, bless that shop and um and, and seeing it being like knocked down price and thinking, well actually it'd be a DVD player and I know I love Jeff Minter mm -hmm. um, but I, I just yeah, money was tight and I couldn't justify it. No, I understand one, that. One yeah. of my regrets has always been not picking up that Neon 3000, which incidentally, mm -hmm. I mean, I talked to him about um, uh, sort of like, you know, my love of Tempest and things like that. Um, and I had a go on the uh, the Neon version. Very, very impressive. To, you know, incredible the limited hardware that you, what you managed to get out of that DVD. It's still better Tempest 2000 just purely because it's better hardware incidentally the tempest 3000 he said it was the most difficult thing he ever had to program yeah <laughs> yeah have everything in his entire career the, mm -hmm. on the new on dvd uh, that was the most difficult but uh yeah i mean that was the thing there is a certain thing with jeff minter that you know uh I, I, if i was a if i was a hardware manufacturer i'd be terrified to put jeff minter on it because he seems to be a death knell <laughs> 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 um, which is definitely not his fault. He produces brilliant games, but he just seems to be the machines that just don't do very well. Um, <laughs> no. But uh, yeah, no, I, I I love this game, and going back to it, it's, as I say, it's sublime on the compilation because, mm -hmm. uh, and, and as I say, on the Atari version, it's on there as well. If you've already got that, because it, they they've you know they they've enhanced the speed, so it's even. You know, it's it's a, it's a subtle thing, but it's where you would have loved it to have been, which, of course, hardware just couldn't. I mean, it still runs at amazing pace, even on the Jaguar hardware. It's just it's just good throughout, isn't it? Uh, I'm, I'm with you. I think it's one of the best sort of trippy shooters like this. And it's probably, I even prefer it over the original Tempest. I think he's, the ideas that he's taken it from. Yeah, uh, the music's a very much important part of that. It's very... We can't understate that enough, Paul, mm. to be honest. Um, it, it showed it just how much... And that, that, that's a surprising thing. If you compare it to his Commodore Day games, we, he was, he was a one-man army doing that, so he wasn't... I mean, he did have a friend that was a musician who helped him mm. with music. But um, in general, there was no real in-game music in that way, was there? But it goes hand in hand in hand. And here is this peak where audio visual playability it all comes together all everything mentor is about is has, has, has been envisaged in in this creation of of tempest and let's be honest he's calling it tempest as well as a licensed version well <laughs> you know, yeah this not... was by atari which which yeah, i think actually exactly. well, that, that's just mentioned because i was done various tempest i think it makes sense to bring it all together because of course he did there's Tempest 4000 you can still buy on Steam. I know you've not historically been a fan of that, but I, I love it. The reason that being, version. there's too much inertia where it doesn't stop fast enough using analog controllers, right? Where you can overshoot your, um, you know, the 
particular tunnel you want to stop in if you want the the, the sector sorry mm. the sector and that's why it pissed me off and i i actually refunded that on steam remember we spoke about that but yeah the i remember you weren't a fan of, i i love it I, I, i'm a big fan of that um you know i think i think tempest 2000 was is probably the peak but they're all good i mean i mean what do you think of tkx on the ps vita right well it, it is visually incredible right mm. it takes tempest i mean this is the trouble we're just taking tempest again and going even more glowy and more trippy visually yeah. trippy mm. right the only downside is is on the vita it's not on a big enough screen for my liking you know what i mean i want it on a data projector at 20 feet wide right I want to take lots of mushrooms and I want to play this game. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's great. It's, it's, it's a yeah. great... It's a shame they never... Uh, my mom, of course, he got in trouble, didn't he, with TXK? Because, of course, it is Tempest and it wasn't Atari licensed, so that's why no. he got a, a bit, a bit mm -hmm. in trouble with it. Because it's a shame it never saw... Well, uh, unless I'm wrong, it never appeared on like the PS4 as like a, a plus game or anything like that. Not around. to my knowledge, I don't know. I never, I never went searching, but it's it's incredible. It's taken. We're so used to the visuals of Tempest Two Thousand, right? It's ingrained in our minds, so you know the the fidelity of that one, and it's very recognisable. So when you go and play it in the Vita, and the, the better hardware capability of it, and it just looks sumptuous, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, no, it's just so I, th I thought it just made sense that we mention all those. They're all essentially the same game with more trippy visuals. Tempest 2000, I'm with you. I think for all the trippiness and the visuals that you get with the later versions, they're not doing anything fundamentally different over the t Tempest 2000. I think I still think that was his, his best of the best, really, of all the versions. <laughs> back on the Jaguar now in 1995 so mm -hmm. um, uh, alongside Tempest 2000 he also created Defender 2000 I think the plan was he was going to go through all the sort of like old classic games whether it was Atari or Williams and do his sort of takes it would have been wonderful to see but of course the Jaguar didn't survive long enough mm -hmm. um, this is basically his answer to Defender it, it's got the trippy visuals. It's taking on a lot of elements of the Conics version that we mentioned as well. You yeah. see little nods there. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I'll be honest, I've never got on with Defender. That's my trouble. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm partly because I'm not good enough at it. I mean, what do you think of Def Defender 2000? Do you I'm not a fan because the biggest problem with it is the spaceship's far too large. Right? Yes, it needs to yeah. be a slick, streamlined craft um, picking up the the hostages and all the rest, I just, it doesn't, it feels more like, and I'll be honest, and I know it's a bit of an insult, it feels more like a PD game. Mm, I, th I think I think it's a little bit better than a PD game, but I agree, I agree with you on the ship. I mean, the t t from a technical standpoint, it's doing a lot of cool things. It's got some nice ideas, there's different modes that you can do, a bit like with, that we forget forgot to mention with Tempest 2000, there's different, you know, uh, traditional, or you can play, the 2000 mode and, and things and to be honest why would you play the traditional when you've got all the extra bells and whistles he's got some nice effects going on but yeah i agree that the ship is too big and whilst it's all moving at a cracking pace because the ship's too big it's too easy to die 
mm-hmm. I found, um, yeah. and, and therefore was frustrating. But I'd, I'd, I'd be a bit kinder than calling it a PV game. Okay. <laughs> um, I didn't gel with it. I, I just don't like it. I don't. I, just, no, I don't but, consider it. Uh, yeah. No, I agree. I, I thought it was important to like at least mention his other Jaguar. Yeah, version. yeah. No, I understand. Yeah, yeah. but I'm, I'm with you. It's not one of my favourites. Let's move on. We're going on to 2008 and we're getting into his final era, or well, no, that sounds terrible to say final era, his latest era. Um, and uh, you final. have yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the latest. What do you know that we don't? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I guess this could have fallen more in, it is kind of a continuation of Tempest. I guess we could have carried it on here. Uh, is Space Draft came out on the 360. Um, I'm trying to think, did it come out on any other ones? It's on PC, you can get on Steam. On PC. And it's kind of, again, like, probably goes a little bit over with the trippy visuals. I mean, you mm. thought it was bad on... It came out before T- TXK. Uh, yeah. yeah, this came out in 2018, and then he sort of almost toned down the visuals by TKX, uh, TXK because he realised... It probably was a bit overkill. Um, I do like it. I mean, I bought it on... I still own it on my um, Xbox 360. I, 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 one of the reasons I wanted to mention it, one, because it's a lot of fun, but also this was when he had that rift, which I which I think does show another side to Jeff, because he's such a congenial chap when you talk to him and everything. But he really took umbrage because you had... A Xbox official magazine gave it a bad review. And he really took it personally. He fell out with the whole of Xbox for a time. He refused to put anything on Xbox or mm. any of his other games. It's only recently he sort of started to sort of like lighten that rule. Um, and I think it was just because he felt that they didn't get the game that he was trying to do yeah. and the fact that it was official yeah. Xbox. But but you think you have to fall out of somebody because they just don't like your game. That's, you know... Mm. Um, but I guess, you know, when you've put a lot of effort and love into a game. I, I mean, know. You, you yeah. can see the forest for the trees sometimes. It's... Yeah. I mean, what do you think with uh, Space Draft? Oh, it's all right. It's just more of the same, really. So, mm. uh, you know, it's it's reasonable, but it doesn't capture the... It doesn't capture you as a player the same way uh, as previous iterations of of Tempest did, that's the trouble. Okay, you feel it like going, okay, Jeff, you've now done this and you're re-envisaging it, you know, you're reimagining it, you're doing slightly different things, but I think you'd probably say at this point, let's not be a one-trick pony here, mate. Yeah, yeah, and that's, uh, I, I sort of agree with, with you on that. I mean, I remember, to be honest, I did get why it got middling reviews on the official Xbox personally. I love I love his games, but it wasn't doing anything particularly new and it was hiding behind lots of trippy visuals to the point where it was just too many visuals. That, you mm. know, it, it was... It was it, it tipped over to the point where it was just being distracting. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. So shall we go on to our final three games? Mm-hmm. Cool. So let's go on to the final... No, I won't say final again. The latest mm. three games <laughs> of Jeff Minter. So this is what I like to call, I mean, although they came out on PC and things, this is where he was dipping his toe into VR. Yeah. And I've been fortunate enough to obviously have, like like you, um, Mm -hmm. a VR unit. And uh, even actually, I remember playing the next game that we're going to be talking about 
with Jeff there. It was, it was showing it off. It was a new, you know, hadn't been released at that point when I'd sort mm-hmm. of seen it. So I think they're sort of special games. Whether you play them without a VR unit, they're still great. But they do go to another level when you play it in VR. And uh, the, the first game I thought worth mentioning is Minotaur Rescue. It's essentially his asteroid 2000 isn't it <laughs> it's yeah. uh it's sort of like you know uh take out the minotaurs uh, flying around and the ast- or collect the, uh, the minotaurs and shoot the asteroids lots of trippy visuals it plays well like you can get it on pc and things like that but playing it in vr it, it with all the depth perception yeah it just takes it to another level i mean this was actually i think yeah i, I think um Putting a well, modern VR, the first experience of modern VR that I personally had was with Minotaur Rescue. It was, it was even before the Oculus had come out. It was a uh, very early days when he showed. I can't remember what unit, but it was uh, like all wires everywhere kind of thing, like a probably a dev Oculus Rift or something like that. But it was, uh, it really got you know got me because of course before that there was the the old uh, virtual headsets was it that you used to get <laughs> from uh, Leicester which was all very jerky visuals and and this was the game Minotaur Rescue that made me understand that VR had a place particularly in like recreating these old games and giving it a new twist I mean I mean do you want to describe it a little bit more to our listeners I'm... yeah I think I mean I think you've nailed it there just with that mm. whole different different take on asteroids just with so much going on. It's still got the... Well, it's non-vector. It's, it's, so think more like the Atari 7800 version of yes. Asteroids, right? Take that, add hallucinogenics, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. lots of messages popping up on the screen like what Mentor did at this phase, you know? Um, Super Zappas Recharge, you know, or whatever. Mm. But and pick up, it's just crazy. Pick up the minotaurs, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just... It, I mean, it's just so much going on that it's a... Uh, sensory overload but i think you nail it and games like this in vr the sense of depth and you know the stars coming towards you the play field it changes it it's like vr always needed to exist for minter's games mm. right from the beginning personally yeah it's free to download um the minotaur project you don't i don't think it's available on steam or anything you can just download it from um the minor project.co.uk and you can download the actual um installer file there so because mm. it always we'll put it in our it show as, notes yeah yeah we'll put that in the show notes yeah it's yeah really good yeah but it's, it's, it's a must if you've got vr give mm. us a try if you don't have vr buy it solely for minters games because the next one coming up is even better oh uh, yeah yeah so that mm. was really him sort of like the minor project was him Dipping his toe, dipping his toe, yeah, into yeah. VR and things, and then um, he came up with in 2016 our penultimate game. He came up with Polybius. Now, of course, Polybius is a nod, isn't it, to that uh, <laughs> um, mythos of yeah. a an art that was supposed to be an arcade machine that was released that turned people crazy, killed people through government craziness. controlled, government arcade controlled, machine. yeah, yeah, all these yeah. sort of like conspiracy theories, and um, and I think Jeff thought it'd be fun to come out with a game based on that name. You know, what would that arcade game look like? As only he could produce it, and so basically he's done a runner shooter. You're running along very fast along um, sort of like a, a, a tube and. Yeah. You shoot everything on sight. If you see it and it moves, shoot it. If you don't see it move, shoot it anyway, just to be make sure. And and that's it, really. It's just absolute. It's probably about the closest you can imagine having a full blown seizure slash trip, <laughs> lovingly recreated for you as only Jeff Minter can. And it is. It's it's incredibly weird and wonderful i love all the little references you get from like the amiga bouncing balls to like little spectrum references and Mm -hmm. and uh all all the gaming past it's one where it keeps showing you've got the gates of the uh the minotaur horns isn't it where or or Mm -hmm. the horns you have to go through that makes you go faster 
Um, but of course, like we mentioned, it's one thing you can play it on Steam. You can buy it on Steam and a variety of different platforms. Um, and it's wonderful. Don't get me wrong. You'll have a mm-hmm. grand old time. But playing it in VR. Oh, my word, God. It's it one of the best VR games I've played. Yeah. yeah. Takes, yeah. It takes it to another level. And it's actually easier because, again, like with the Minotaur project, uh, you know, Minotaur Rescue that we mentioned before, there's so much visually going on. Without that depth perception, it, it becomes too much. You, you lose where things are. But with the depth perception that... that vr gives you it suddenly becomes a lot easier to negotiate and and i adore this game i mean i i will happily play this without the vr unit i have many many times but when i put on my vr it's usually one of the first games i yeah hook hook myself up to it's uh it's fantastic i'm, I'm with you it's probably one of my favorite experiences in vr mm-hmm yeah it's, awesome. it's kind of what you vision vr would be about in that way that kind of lawnmower man meets because there's bits of res in it there's bits of it is a tunnel shooter at its core but i love how on some levels you're inside the tunnel and Mm. sometimes you're on the exterior of the tunnel going around its cylindrical shape you know so it's so varied so much going on and the music is sensational yeah 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 oh it's, it's so good so good one of the best vr experiences i've played yeah, yeah, I, I adore Pluius, and, and it's it's weird, you don't hear that many people talk about it. I've heard no one, no. until now. I've, well, I've, apart from I've, us, when we, we, we've been chittering in the, yeah. in the years past, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, mean, I mean, now, now I'm at the point where I pretty much, if I can, I'll buy a Jeff Minter game, because I so love his games. Mm-hmm. Um you know, I'll I'll, uh, I'll pick it up if you know if I can. Although having said that, I haven't picked up the next game yet. Uh, I've got to be honest here. I've not. Uh, like why he's not done it yeah. yet. Yeah, but I felt for the last game of the evening. Is there any more you want to say about that one? No, no. I think we've we've covered this well, no. mate. Um, for the last game, I thought we may, ought to mention because it's his most recent release, and it's it is it's a trippy, wonderful game. It is Aka R. I think that's how you pronounce it. Yep. And it's a sort of, I don't know, how do you describe it from the trailer? This is something that both of us have only seen video footage of, I, I assume. Is well, it? it's just a reimagining of uh, yeah, what's that game? project. Yeah, Yeah, but it's based on that arcade game, isn't it? It's sort of where it's like, basically got things coming towards you. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember. Um, there's, it's um, like being in a petri dish mm. and things are uh, in, in coming towards you, invading and expanding. It's very surreal. And I'm trying to. I there mean, there is a, there's the, a video game, arcade game based on it. I know. You know, that he's taken the concept and he's done his own. Yeah, but wasn't that not. It wasn't. It didn't get past prototype boards, Paul. Ah, so it's like based on a prototype. Well, that's probably where yeah. I've played it. It's probably, yeah. Uh, so, but there has been other ones similar to it. But yeah, it's just the idea, isn't it? You're just essentially shooting the aliens around you before that gets to you, isn't it? That's from what I can tell. Yeah, I mean, I mean, do, do you you probably read into this a bit more. Did you do you know any more about it? Or I try to understand it. You can't understand it from watching the videos. I mean, I've watched the you know footage mm. of the original, and the therefore the. This, this reimagining of it. I mean, as I said, it's like you're in this kind of petri dish and all the invaders are coming in, but when they shoot them, they change shape and have an effect on the the surface of the area you're on. But I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to get a grasp of it. I'm, I'm, I'm just one of these things, this looks great, I play this, I hope it's in VR. That's what I'm saying to myself. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. It's not because, but I would love it, I'd love it to be. Yeah, I mean, I mean, th- this is... Um... He's done it for the Atari VCS. You remember that sort mm. of like homebrew system, but it's because obviously that's not been a particular success. He's, it, you can get it now on the Switch, the PS4, PS5, Windows, and Xbox One and Xbox Series XS. So you can buy it on all the platforms. Um, I'll be honest. I mean, up until we did this show and and looking at his game library of you know with the compilation i hadn't fully appreciated that he'd released this game or i'd I'd heard vague things about it but hadn't realized it being released so um that's probably the only reason i've not picked it up i think i will pick it up because any jeff minter game i think is 
special and needs to be we you know we need to support people like jeff because he makes the gaming world a special special place mm. yeah and yeah yeah thanks to jeff so that's all the games of that we've mentioned there's i say there's loads we left on the the, the cutting room floor but as I say, the, pu- the purpose was not to do every single bloody blooming game that he's ever done because he's done hundreds, it seems, <laughs> or, or a hell of a lot. He's done a hell of a lot. Exhaust ourselves again if he did something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and it'd be too much for our listeners as well because a lot yeah. of them are, as you say, quite similar. Um, just as an encapsulation, is there any anything you want to sort of like you know summarize with Jeff games right. I and mean, what makes them so special? Do you think? Yeah, I mean, like like we said, he does his own thing. Yes. Yeah, so, people argue he doesn't do an original thing mm. right but that's not his point he just wants to make enjoyable games he sees something that inspires him and he believes in the game he plays he's making a game that he wants to play first mm. foremost and primarily he's making a game for himself good for him and if people like his games and want to jo- and, and join him on that journey of that then they are most welcome too. And if, like yourself, and I've seen that from documentaries, that when people go and engage with him about his games and that, he he speaks passionately about them. He believes in his products, and uh, yeah. I think the gaming world is a better place that he because he exists in it, and he is one of the first kind of rock star gaming coders out there. He's been there from the very beginning, and he's been in our you know, life's... And I've, I've played... Whether I realised there were Jeff Minter games back in... You know what I mean? You don't. It's only until more recent years and you re- retrospectively look back that you realise, oh, that was a Minter game, that was a Minter game. Yeah, I played that, I played that and enjoyed mm. that. You know, I mean, there's ones that clearly you know are... Oh, the whole llamas and cheap and, and whatnot else. But um, he's been there all your days. He's And he, he still continues to deliver games, so good for him and um you know i want more more from him until until he gives up his last breath i want jeff Minter to continue making games yeah no i'm the same way and, and you're right i mean he he does he sort of like will play his games I and mean, that's what he says isn't he? he literally will at the end of every evening just play his game at that particular iteration solidly mm. to make sure that it you know it, it's addictive as hell and, and it's definitely working and and i think it's a special thing because and this is what i love actually about just indie games in general is whereas like with bigger like triple a products and things there's so many people involved mm-hmm. that you don't you lose that sort of auteur you lose that um that, mm. that guiding north star that 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 singular vision mm-hmm. whether with with the indie what makes them i think so much better games at their core is you, you you're losing all that noise of voices trying to make a game and and do and, and pulling it in different directions and you just go mm. back to the days that we loved in the spectrum and the amiga and you know those early days when it was just a handful you know, I mean, I mean, this is even in his later games. It's him, it's Jeff Minter, it's his partner Giles, and usually he'll bring in like a musician to yep. to, to do the music track, and that's it. And that's exactly as it was, like on all the games that we grew up with, and I and I, I think that sense has been lost with modern gaming. You can see it imploding at the moment mm-hmm. with modern gaming because they just cost too much they've got too many pen pushers and you know uh storyboard consultants and all this stuff you just yeah in my mind you don't need any of that crap you need to just need people to make good games that's all you need yeah. and yeah. and you know but I, I know that's that's a personal thing i mean there's people that love stories and their games and stuff but for me gameplay is it's what Jeff epitomizes. Oh, it's part of me. It's part of me. Yeah. yeah, that gameplay loop. Is it addictive? Is it fun? Does it drive me to want to like get a higher score or get further, or whatever it is? Mm-hmm. That yep. to me is gaming and always will be. Um, yeah. Which is why whenever there's a cutscene, I've usually skipped it. Or <laughs> exactly. 
Yeah, I don't. It doesn't. No interest. If I wanted to watch something, I would. Uh, you know, it's the same with like Kojima. I know. I know people rave about him, but for me, no. Sorry, he's he just wants to be a storyteller. Yeah. Um. Uh, he, he wants to be. Uh. Sorry, a, a film storyteller. And mm. well, yeah. For me, I. That's. I'd rather watch a film. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I realise that's an unpopular opinion. I know there's loads of people love people like Kojima and other people like him. But yeah, so there you go. I think uh, I think we've encapsulated his uh, mm-hmm. history well. I think it's uh, I think it's a wonderful library. I definitely recommend this compilation. I think it's a double thumbs up from me. Is it same from you, Kingy? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, when I first went, I, I, I thought twice about about the collection and and so forth. And will I reconnect with the games? Games that you know you know are dated to a degree and will I go back and have as as much enjoyment? Do I want to spoil the the memories Memory. I have? Mm. That what what is my nostalgia going to be like for these? But going back well one, there was ones I hadn't played. They were fantastic. Two of the ones that I did play were just as good now as they were back then. So I've had a, an absolute blast going through these and the stum on the collection I don't like, but that's fine. It's just, you know, you can't like everything any anybody's and any individual's done. But yeah, not everything's part, gonna I mean, hold up in modern. I mean, they're all good in their own way, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I, but for the most part, mm. that, well, yeah. Again, it's a very tasteful presentation overall, and I'm looking forward to where Digital Eclipse goes next because they're doing a bit like Minter himself. Mm. They are doing something very different in terms of retro gaming that I think needs to be recognised as well. I think it's important that... part. It, it is a digital museum, and and their mm-hmm. their UI user interface that they use mm-hmm. of just following the lines through the story or being able to like go straight to the games. I think mm-hmm. works fantastically well. Um, yeah. It really tells you the story of that person, but more importantly. They really put that effort, as I say, to make these games look like they did back then. They did the same thing on the Atari collection as mm. well, mm-hmm. um, which I think is so important. I mean, it always like um, I don't know what it's like since it's moved up to um, is it moved to Sheffield, but the, I went to like the computer museum in okay. when it was in um, uh, when it was in uh, Nottingham. So it was years ago now because it's been up in the thing and. You know, I'd be like grinding my teeth because they've like put it in widescreen, and it's like you're calling yourself a museum. Yeah, and you're not even using like CRTs, which I kind of get, but you're not even making it look like it looked on yep. a CRT, and you're putting it out of ratio, and you're calling yourself a museum. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 I feel the same like when I go to NQ sixty four on places yeah. like the pubs. As good as it is, when I see like um, you know, they haven't bothered buying like retro tink or anything. You know, and they're putting like mega drives through flat screen TVs in the wrong yeah. ratio, and it's yeah. it, it it annoys me from the point of there's people that will have looked, you know, that either gone to the museum or they've looked at they've gone to NQ sixty four and they've come away with completely the wrong impression mm-hmm. of what made these old systems great because the you know the people in charge have been lazy enough to not make it look Absolutely, like it should yeah. have done. Yeah. Um, and I think it's just so important. So it's, it really pleases. And, and, and we've, and how many times have we seen that on even previous retro compilations? I mean, the, as good as Midway arcade treasures is the amount of games that had, and that was done by digital clips, but you know, there were games that just, they didn't bother getting the controls right. Yeah, you've got to nail it. You've got to mm. deliver the experience as close as to how it was back at that point, or otherwise you're not capturing that snapshot in the right way. Mm, definitely. Anyway, I think it's been a great show, and mm-hmm. uh, I've really enjoyed it. Any final thoughts or, or any anything you want to shout out to anybody before we wrap things up? No, I'm all good, mate. Um, 
I'm chatted out. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Well, boys and girls, I hope you enjoyed another episode and uh, look forward to you joining us on this journey and playing through some of these games, uh, whether through the compilation or without, because you can get them on emulators and they're just as good. So uh, until next time, keep it retro. Bye. Safety instruction card, located in the seat pocket in front of you, explains and illustrates the important safety features of this aircraft. This card should be read carefully before takeoff, and then returned to the seat pocket for use by our future passengers. The emergency exits are the four doors on the left side of the aircraft. and the four doors on the right side of the aircraft.